But Katarina, just for me to be sure, we don't have to reconnect. We can stay on this link. Yes. Yes, yes we just started uh, in this moment. Uh, we just started the, the webinar. Yeah. There was a, an opening now. The, the opening of the registration, oh, no, not the registration, but entering, the, the opening of the answer into the... Into yes, the as you can see, you, you have you two... See the number of participants now is getting higher and higher. Yes, it's doubling. It's doubling every three min to every minute. So I mean, uh, I think also the commission should Marta Iglesias should be connected. Uh, yes, yes, I am. I am. Hi, Marta. How Hello, you doing? Claudio. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm happy to see you. <laughs> yeah, happy to see you too. I start exactly at 10 or maybe a few minutes after 10. What do you think? Uh, maybe we can wait like um, five minutes. Two, three yeah. minutes. I see I, I see the number of participants is uh, is getting higher and higher. Let's wait, let's still wait for three, three, four minutes. In order that we stabilize, we stabilize the number of participants. So until now, the event is live recording on uh, Leap for FNSSA Facebook page. Okay, so in a bit we can start. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome all of you to our workshop. My name is Rosomari, a research scientist with the Science and Technology Policy Research Institute. And I will be the moderator for this uh, session. And uh, Ibrahim Asante will be the rapporteur. We welcome you to this workshop on Dialogue for Action and brokerage in West Africa, fostering knowledge, communication, and innovation hubs. This workshop is an activity under the Leap for FNSSA project, which is being implemented by a consortium of 35 partners across Europe and Africa. The project seeks to improve the effectiveness of EU-AU partnerships for food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. So for today and tomorrow, we shall be discussing how to better strengthen the EU-AU partnerships and collaboration in food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture with a special focus on West Africa. We will also discuss how to mobilize access including researchers, innovators, farmers, and other value chain actors, funders, and policymakers. 
and how to forge alliances between these actors in Europe and West Africa. Then finally, we also discussed how best to bring research outputs and innovations to investors, farmers, and value, other value chain actors to ensure their adoption for maximum impact. So we thank you once again for joining us for this two-day workshop. So we, now, we are now at the scene setting session. We have five speakers who will throw more light on the Leave for FNSSA project and also on the importance of the EU-AU partnership for food and nutrition security. So for the participants who have joined us, you can post your questions using the Q&A option and the speakers will address them when we move to the next session, which is the panel A. So I will now invite the speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Wilhelmina Kwe. She is a director for the Science and Technology Policy Research Institute of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in Ghana. She is an agricultural economist and a gender expert with over 25 years working experience in research and practice. Dr. Wilhelmina Kwe, we now have the platform to give us your speech. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mrs. Moderator. Uh, welcome to the virtual West Africa workshop, a dialogue for action and brokerage in West Africa, fostering knowledge, communication, and innovation hubs. Our most cherished guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. Permit me to give a bit of background on food and nutrition security. Gro globally, there are 690 million people who are hungry with the burden of malnutrition in all its forms yet to be tackled. Recent data from the Food and Agriculture Organization indicates that 144 million of children under five years are stunted, 47 million wasted and 38 0.3 million overweight. About 2 million people in the world lack regular access to sufficient and nutritious food. In South Sahara Africa, malnutrition is severe with many challenges slowing improvement. Over a third of the population suffers from undernutrition. 2018, FAO reported that the prevalence of undernourishment was rising in the region. The latest data shows that the deterioration has slowed, but there remain 256 million hungry people in Africa, with 239 million in Sub Sahara Africa. Over the last two decades, Ghana has witnessed a considerable decline in all major malnutrition indicators, but their prevalence still remains unacceptably high. The, high, the, the rates of something was reported to be 18% in 2017, 2018, 13% of children under five underweight, these significant numbers of people, especially women and children, are still affected by micronutrition deficiencies. Stunting an emerging issue of overnutrition that ultimately undermine their health and development. An integral part of meeting key, develop, key targets of sustainable development goal two, to end hunger, achieve food and nutrition security, and promote sustainable agriculture 
is creating strategic alliances of actors because SDG2 is interconnected with and in, interdependent on several other SDGs that strongly relate to food security and nutrition, including SDG1 on poverty, SDG3 on health, education, SDG4, SDG5 on gender equality, water and sanitation, SDG6, the climate, SDG13, life below water, 14, and life on land which is SDG 15. This virtual West Africa dialogue for action and brokerage in West Africa, which is under the long-term EU-AU research and innovation partnership for food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture, is, an, is a coordination and support action program, one whose main objective is to provide a tool for European and African institutions, both public and private sector players, civil society organizations, policy makers, development partners and funders, researchers, businesses, media, and various actors to engage in a sustainable partnership platform for research and innovation on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. The LIB for FNSSA aims to achieve its main objective through one, enhanced synergies and coherence between actors, research and innovation projects, initiatives and programs through the development of institutional alliances and cluster of projects. Two, through an enhanced learning environment and large knowledge base, including monitoring and evaluation activities, establish communication and links between different initiatives in order to improve European African collaboration in science, technology, and innovation. And lastly, a well established long term sustainable partnership and co funding mechanism. The main action in this on support, the ability to create, strengthen, and facilitate, especially facilitating within the relevant food and nutrition, security, and sustainable agriculture, research, and innovation networks. The Leave for FNSSA is a network. And on behalf of the network, I'm inviting you all to join the West African Alliance. Permit me to highlight the objectives of this meeting on West Africa Dialogue for Action and Brokerage in West Africa. The first, strengthening Europe-West Europe Western African collaboration on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture as a pilot for regional alliance of African and European actors to launching an AU-EU funders alliance dedicated to research and innovation on food, nutrition, security, and sustainable agriculture, and get feedback from participants, and mobilizing actors in the Western African sub-region to forge alliances with European actors on research and innovation. In view of all these, the first panel section will focus on policies and programs on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. Permit me to touch a bit on policies. Ghana's Ministry of Food and Agriculture is finalizing its food and agriculture sector development policy, FASEP 3, in line with global, continental, and national development frameworks, such as the Sustainable Development Goals, the AU Agenda 2063, the Malabo Declaration, the Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program that started of the NEPAD, and ECOWAS 2025 Strategic Framework relating to food and nutrition security. Here in Ghana, we have a Ghana Agriculture Investment Plan, which spans 2018 to 2021, which also aligns with our national medium term development plan. We call it Agenda for Jobs, Creating Prosperity and Opportunity for all, 
focusing on one, promoting a demand-driven approach to agricultural development, ensuring improved public and private investment, improving production efficiency and yields, improving post-harvest management, enhancing application of science, technology, and innovation, promoting agriculture as a viable business among the youth, promoting livestock and poultry development for food and nutrition security and income generation. In addition to these policy directions, COVID-19 pandemic has also opened up opportunities for innovation in the agricultural value chains, including e extension and business advisory services, e marketing, developing new food and nutrition products to meet the ever changing customer, consumer tastes and demands. The Ghana National Nutrition Policy also seeks to improve coverage of high impact nutrition specific intervention that ensure optimal nutrition of all Ghanaian, particularly the paternal health and child survival, address underlying causes of malnutrition, development issues that require a well-coordinated policy directions and facilitate capacity building in key areas such as management, governance, cross-sector coordination, and integration of nutrition at all levels. Our national health policy also seeks to strengthen the healthcare delivery service to be resilient and encourage adoption of healthy lifestyles, including healthy nutrition and improve physical environment among others. Ladies and gentlemen, the statistics and the policy direction so far bring into sharp focus the importance of this virtual uh, meeting on the leap for FNSAC. Dialogue that I encourage you or entreat you all to share your ideas and lessons and best practices. And I also encourage you to be active participants on the Sustainable Partnership Platform for Research and Innovation on Food and Nutrition Security and Sustainable Agriculture. And most importantly, join the West Africa Alliance. We here at Science and Technology Policy Research Institute and the CSIR pride ourselves as an active partner in this noble endeavor. Once again, I welcome you all to this platform and I wish you all a fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kwe, for this uh, speech. We will now move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Laila Lokosan. Dr. Lokosan is the CADEP Advisor on Food and Nutrition Security at the African Union Commission. He is a seasoned information system specialist with over 25 years working experience. Dr. Laila, I know you have been busy planning for the commemoration of the African Day for Food and Nutrition Security, which is taking place tomorrow and Friday. So we know you are very busy and we are very grateful that you were able to join us this morning. So please, the platform is yours. Thank you a lot, uh, Rose, and uh, thank you, uh, Henning, and all colleagues um, in the panel. Um, Dr. Wilhelmina Kwai, um, I'm pleased to uh, really state that the African Union Commission. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry if you are hearing me. We can hear you, yes? Yes, we yes, can hear uh, you. Actually, just power went off. <laughs> Connected to the uh, net official network here, and it is a power off, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, I'm pleased to underscore that um, the AU Commission uh, represented by two departments, Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture and Department of Human Resources, Science and Technology, um, have been um, 
right on top of this um, leap for FNSSA um, working group. And uh, I would just want to share a few points um, based on our partnership and our AU perspectives, as well as uh, uh, the, on policy directions with regards to the uh, food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture and the research agenda in general. I'm pleased to speak to this uh, leap for FNSSA dialogue for action and brokerage for West Africa. Um, the focus of the dialogue which is on linking small business to existing research and innovation hubs to test solutions with research funding opportunities is of relevance in the context of existing AU policy directions to build and sustain resilient food systems and mainstreaming nutrition into the agricultural development uh, interventions. Now we move to what our expectations are having drawn from this relevance. Our expectations as the Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture is for the leap for FNSSA network to extend to new areas of current focus. And this include one, promoting and leveraging innovation and information technology in agri-food systems, specifically to attract youth in agriculture and agribusiness in a holistic and inclusive value chain investment approach. Digitalization of the agri-food systems is backed, is, uh, is backed up by high level policy platforms, such as the recent joint ministerial declaration and action agenda. The focus of this year's or the 11th Africa Day for Food and Nutrition Security, in which Rose has just mentioned, is making agri-food systems resilient, productive, available, and accessible. Six of Africa's leading agricultural research institutions will participate in a dialogue in this area, in addition to World Food Program, Africa Development Bank, African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, and the European Commission. Um, this is in the context of, it will be, uh, there is a session dedicated to this. And in fact, that our discussions here are relevant to this because we're talking of the research agenda in the context of the leap for FNSSA. Um, and we are looking for areas that are less invested in, uh, which needs to be taken to scale. And this include projects for mainstreaming nutrition into agriculture, such as food fortification, biofortification, and comprehensive homegrown school feeding, comprehensive and inclusive, in fact. Then investment in crops, and animal breeds that prove to be resilient to droughts and pests and adapted to local conditions. And also high consideration should be given to encouraging production of indigenous crops, animal breeds and fish species to avail diets that are rich in micronutrient content. With the impending establishment of Blue Economy Division at the newly structured and or newly or to be soon structured Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy and Environment at the AU Commission, there is need for the LEAP for FNSSA network to consider participating in planning and strategy development sessions uh, in the coming few months. As the focal person of my department within the LEAP for FNSSA network, I stand ready to play an active role in the forthcoming engagements. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you and 
happy to say that this session um, is kicking off and I wish uh, you um, to come up with the very, um, with the practical and fruitful uh, outcomes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Laila, for this wonderful presentation. And we assure you that we will share whatever outcome we have from this meeting with you. So I will encourage participants to keep on posting your questions and comments in the Q&A section. They will be addressed when we move on to the next session. So our next presenter is Marta Iglesias who is a lead for FNSSA policy officer at the European Commission. Marta is a civil engineer with master's degree in civil engineering. Marta, we know that very few women find themselves in the engineering field. So as STEPRI here, we are now conducting a study to understand the systemic barriers to women's participation in, the, in, the, in the engineering. So you being an engineer will be coming to you to learn from you how you were able to survive in this field. So Marta, the floor is yours. Let's listen to your speech. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosamari. Dear Wilhelmina Kwaye, dear Leila Lokonsang, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to participate today at this dialogue for West Africa. I want to start by congratulating the League for FNSSA project who has the organization of this event. You all know that the relationship with Africa and in particular with the African Union is a priority for the European Commission. I take this opportunity to thank the excellent collaboration we have with the African Union and in particular within this FNSSA partnership. In this respect of collaboration with other regions across the world, I would like to stress that the European Union has mobilized around 12 point billion euros to promote food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture in over 80 countries in the last seven years. Since 2010, the European Union has supported more than 100 million people lacking access to sufficient amounts of safe and nutritious food through its humanitarian food assistance policy. We are here today because more than ever, we know that research and innovation as well as education are crucial for our societies. Current challenges like climate change and environmental degradation or the COVID-19 crisis have put research and innovation at the top of the agenda showing the necessity for a stronger international cooperation in research and innovation to find solutions to these common problems affecting our societies in Africa, in Europe, and worldwide. To take up these huge challenges, we need to work together. We need to promote a change in the way we produce and consume food. We need sustainable food systems that offer healthy and nutritious food, and at the same time, preserve our environment. However, ensuring sustainable food system is a still a major challenge today. Agriculture is alleviating pressure on natural resources, including soils and water, halting the loss of biodiversity and facing uncertainties of the climate change. To overcome these challenges, Europe has put in place a new growth strategy, the European Green Deal, aiming at transforming the European Union into a modern, resource-efficient and competitive economy without any net emissions of greenhouses, of greenhouse gases by 2050. This will happen by turning the climate and environmental challenges into opportunities across all policy areas, including agriculture. The European Green Deal is composed of several strategies in different areas, from transport to energy, climate, or food systems. In particular, the Farm to Fork strategy, which was adopted recently in May, 
promotes a fair, healthy, environment-friendly food systems in Europe, but also outside Europe. We will engage with our international partners to build these green alliances and promote the standards for sustainable food systems so that we can meet collectively the collectively agreed sustainable development goals. Past efforts focus on boosting agricultural output to produce more food. Today, challenges, including climate change, require a new approach. A transition to more sustainable food systems that produce more with more socioeconomic benefits and with less environmental consequences is needed. Putting our food systems on a sustainable path will also bring new opportunities for operators in the food value chain. New technologies and scientific discoveries combined with increasing public awareness and demand for sustainable food will benefit all stakeholders, from producers to consumers. Research and innovation support is necessary to enable and accelerate these transitions towards a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food systems in Europe and in Africa. Advisory services, financial instruments and research and innovation are instrumental as they can help resolve tensions, develop and test solutions, overcome barriers and uncover new market opportunities. With in the next European Union Research and Innovation Program, the so-called Horizon Europe, it will last seven years from 21 to 27. The European Commission has proposed a budget of around 9 billion euros for research in the cluster area of food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture and environment. This cluster will cover food research and innovation with particular reference to climate change adaptation and mitigation, agroecology, sustainable land management and land governance, conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, inclusive and fair value change, nutrition and healthy diets, prevention and responses to food crisis, particularly in fragile context, resilience and risk preparedness, integrated pest management, animal health and welfare, and food system standards. Africa is full of talent and creativity with amazing entrepreneurial innovation ecosystems, as well as innovation hub all around the continent. What needs to be done is to avoid fragmentation, connect these hubs, projects and people with each other to maximize the benefit and at the same time to connect them with our European networks. On our side, from the beginning of the crisis, we reiterated the importance of research and innovation cooperation with Africa. The Africa strategy adopted in March already identifies the need to work together to develop a knowledge society and economy. The only way to achieve this common goal is through research and innovation and education. This brings me to my final point, the focus on people, on our researchers, innovators, on our youth, our girls and women in science. We need to equip them with the right skills and competences. Therefore, the link with the universities, higher education institutes become fundamental. To sum up and conclude, I just want to stress four elements. We need to continue our well-established collaboration EU-AU to achieve our shared interests and challenges while striving towards an inclusive and sustainable development. We have our shared FNSSA roadmap that set the basis for a joint research and innovation agenda we should pursue with, the, with its implementation. We have to enhance investments in research and innovation for food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. We have to give visibility to the research and innovation outputs to capitalize on the investments. And we have to support innovation ecosystems in food and nutrition security that will offer concrete benefits for our people in Africa and in Europe. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Martha, for this presentation. We are grateful. So our next presenter is Maurizio Riley. He's the director for Kihem, Mediterranean Agronomic Institute of Bari. <clears throat> he is a very well a, a learned person. He has authored over 50 scientific publications on issues related to international cooperation, natural resources, 
and organic Mediterranean agriculture. He's so much knowledgeable in all these issues. So we now invite Maurizio Riley to give us his speech. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rosomari, for giving me the floor. And uh, good morning, uh, everybody. I'm uh, very glad uh, and uh, very delighted uh, to meet uh, you all uh, in this uh, virtual meeting. And uh, it is a great honor for me to introduce uh, the first section of this event. First of all, let me to thank the European uh, Commission here represented by the policy officer, uh, Mrs. Marta Iglesias for uh, her strong support to the dialogue between EU and Africa in fostering research, cooperation and innovation in agriculture, nutrition and food security. Let me also give my regards and thanks to CIRAD, represented today by Philippe Petitguimin, for uh, the impressive coordination of this project and uh, to Dr. Laila Lakosang of the African Union Commission. And I also would like to thank all partners, participants, innovators, speakers engaged in this event. You are the real actors of this uh, today's uh, program. I am uh, here and uh, really I am very glad to be here to represent uh, Siambari, Siambari partner of this project and uh, coordinator and uh, responsible of the work package for communication and uh, dissemination. And uh, I would like to take this occasion to express my special thanks to the CM team. Uh, I see uh, most of uh, my colleagues uh, uh, that are here and um, for, the, for their efforts made for the success of this event, which I hope you will appreciate in these two days. SIAM, my institute, the Italian seat of uh, international organization, is uh, strongly focused in supporting international research and cooperation actions, aim, aimed to define a new innovation path in food and agriculture sector, especially encouraging youth uh, entrepreneurship innovation, startup of CM member countries, of course, in North Africa and Middle East, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa to turn innovative ideas into marketable solutions and to accelerate the access to market and the dialogue with the international investors as well. This uh, scenario is part of my organization and is part of, uh, in particular, of Siambari long-term virtuous framework composed by single actions and projects, all uh, connected by a fil rouge which is not only in our intentions, but also in the dynamic and continuous participation of the human capital involved. On this uh, regard, I would like to mention some, uh, I think, uh, relevant activities carried out by my organization in the past years. The innovation brokerage with North Africa and Middle East countries in the frame of EU funded the project MedSpring. For uh, these events, 
we mobilized 130 young innovators and uh, entrepreneurs to propose ideas and meet with research managers, investors, and research agencies. Some partnerships were also developed. The new Siam Bari Master course, uh, the title is uh, Open Innovation and Youth Entrepreneurship in the Mediterranean Agri-Food Sector, aimed to train a new generation of Mediterranean innovation managers. The open uh, dialogue among the private and institutional actors of this specific uh, innovation path is also highlighted by the launch and the coordination of the Mediterranean Innovation Partnership, engaging national agencies and governmental institutions from all the CM member countries into a permanent policy and technical dialogue on innovation in food and agriculture. The initiative funded and led by my institute is aimed to improve national innovation initiatives in all the Mediterranean region. The coordination of two important innovation actions on agriculture, water, and neglected crops in East Africa and West Africa in the frame of a big program, the SIRA, the SIRA program supported by DG Devco. Dear participants, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the current pandemic due to COVID-19, as well as the other epide epide epidemics, SARS, Ebola, malaria, together with other stress of for African agriculture, like locustus in East Africa and drought in South Africa, are putting the entire African agriculture sector in crisis, compromising the efforts made so far by the various countries to reduce poverty and hunger. In response to the challenges described above, agribusiness have demonstrated the ability to, innov to innovate by relying and promoting e-commerce platforms for handling supply orders, packaging essential food items for delivery or pickup. This uh, reflect the flexibility of agriculture in enterprises to adapt to changing environments and highlight their capability to adopt innovative approaches to keep the supply chain operational. Siambari, my institute in line with the current trends is looking for innovative solutions to mitigate the socioeconomic and the environmental impacts of pandemics with particular attention to the climatic dimension. In this context, and I, I conclude, importance is given to agri-ecological agri transition of food systems innovation and digitalization in agriculture and the short value chain, which represents the three topics chosen for the call 
for innovative ideas launched in view the West Africa workshop. As you know, the two-day event entitled to the Dialogue for Action and Brokerage in West Africa has two main objectives. First, supporting innovators, making their idea visible. And second, creating the best conditions for all the possible partnership and financial relationship with venture capitalists, business angels, and in general, international investors. CM is motivated, but I think we are all motivated, committed and honored to cooperate for the implementation of the outcomes of this important workshop. Also empowering new technologies of virtual web meeting compliant with the current pandemic contingency. Contingency, sorry. So that you once again for being here today and I wish you all the best for a fruitful and successful work session. And let me use an Italian expression to wish the project to reach its goals by sailing always with very favorable winds. Buon vento a tutti e grazie per l'attenzione. Okay, thank you very much. I wish I could thank you in uh, Italian language, but uh, all the same, I will have to learn. Yeah, so thank you very much for your speech. We are already running behind time. Our final speaker for this session is Philip Petit Gweni. I'm pronouncing it just as it is written. And uh, he is a research and strategy deputy director at CIRAD in France. And he is a farm systems agronomist and has over 30 years work experience in the field of agriculture for development. He is a coordinator for this Lead for FNSSA project. So Philip, let's hear your statement. Thank you, Rose. Uh, I hope you can, you can hear me. So thank you for inviting me to participate to this uh, opening session. And uh, I'd like to uh, present my greetings to uh, the colleagues, to you, Rose, and the colleagues who have been joining in this opening session, but also to all the participants. I will try to be quick, and, and I will try to contribute to set the scene, as it's the title of this session, around two issues, the FNSSA roadmap and the, um, the, the objective of LIB for FNSSA project. As you, most of you probably know, the EU and the AU have established a roadmap to guide their collaboration in research and innovation on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture, in short, FNSSA. This roadmap was approved in uh, March 2016 for 10 years, so it lasts until uh, the end of 2025. It has three uh, thematic pillars, sustainable intensification, food system and nutrition, and market and trade. But it also has highlighted the importance of some cost-cutting activities, like for instance, strengthening research and innovation capacities. And that will be probably an item which will be discussed in today's and tomorrow's workshop on how to better support innovators and innovation processes. One characteristic of this roadmap is that it does not describe an aid program. It is a partnership between two continents. And this means that these thematic priorities have been selected because they respond to the expectation of farmers, consumers, and citizens of Africa and of Europe. And I think it's quite important to always remember that these priorities are priorities of a joint interest for both continents. Since 2016, many projects have been funded to support progress along this roadmap. 
in particular through the European programs like Horizon 2020 and, and the Desira initiatives. And some have been mentioned by, by Marta Iglesias and by Mauricio Raeli. So I come to my second point, which is uh, Leap for FNSSA, which is one of these projects funded by Horizon 2020 and supporting the progress on the FNSSA roadmap. The main objective of uh, Leap for FNSSA is to establish a platform to support this partnership. This platform will gather all institutions, public and or private, from the diverse categories of stakeholders from Europe and from Africa, who commit to work together to align their activities in a coordinated way between both continents to contribute to the progress on this FNSSA roadmap. The platform in itself will provide to its members access to organized information. It will support their coordination and facilitate the identification of synergies between all the participants. It is, should also be one of the main channel for funding, in particular fun, funding coming from the EC and the AUC, funding targeting research and innovation activities in the FSSA, FNSSA domain between the both continents. How this platform will be organized is still to be decided. And uh, I see one possibility is that it will give space for collaboration between Europe and Africa, also at the regional scale, like West Africa collaboration between European institution and West African institution, which is the case of this virtual workshop. So your discussion will very much contribute to uh, uh, helping to define uh, this platform. And hopefully, I hope that some of the participants to uh, today's and tomorrow's discussion will also manifest their interest to, to join the, the platform. You can be expected that very soon, we will contact you all so that you can uh, start expressing your interest, expressing your willingness to uh, commit to join the, this platform. So. With these few words, uh, I wish uh, fruitful discussions. And of course, you understand that, that I will shall be particularly interested by the conclusions that you will reach at the end of these two days. With these few words, Rose, back to you. I hope I was quick enough. I know we are running short of time. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Philip. You, you were really on time and uh, yeah. It's all well. So thank you to all the speakers in this session. We encourage you to stay in the next session because there are some questions that uh, are being addressed to you. So we'll now move to the next session, which is the panel one, policies and programs on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture, building West Africa chapter and AU-EU Funders Alliance. So this section will be moderated by Henning. Henning works with the Federal Office of, for Agriculture and Food in Germany. He's a biologist with expertise in funding, research management, international policy, knowledge management, development corporate. In fact, he's well experienced. So I will hand over to Henning now as the moderator for this section. So Henning, over to you. Deros, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Welcome to panel one. Um, I'm here together with Jackie Cadeau, who is the director of NASAC, the Network of African Science Academies. She's the rapporteur and I would like to introduce you to this discussion now, please, with the first presentation to give you an idea on the topic. Thank you very much. So please go to the next slide. So the panel theme is policies and programs on food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture which is FNSSA in West Africa. The frame given is 
the EU-AU Cooperation in Research and Innovation and the Partnership for Green Transition Programs for Sustainable Intensification, Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition, Expansion and Improvement of Agricultural Trade and Markets, and Cross-Cutting Issues, for Women, Youth and Innovators launched within the latest European Research and Innovation for FNSSA. So this is the frame given by the FNSSA roadmap which Philippe Ipiti Huguenin mentioned. Next slide, please. So you're very welcome to this session and the objective of this initiative is to launch a West African FNSSA chapter of the AUEU partnership. And now what is the motivation to invite our participants to this panel, number one? The motivation is that the partners of the Leap for FNSSA project warmly invite partners in West Africa and also, of course, in other countries of the EU-AU partnership to join into the R&I collaboration within the frame of the AU-EU partnership. Next slide, please. So here you have a list of the panel members. I will introduce them to you in more detail once uh, they are presenting. We have here Dr. Hamidou Tambora, from Fonrit, we have Dr. Sylvie Lewicki from CIRAD, we have Dr. Abdou Tenkuano from CORAF, we have Dr. Irene Anor Frampong from FARA, we have Ernest Ubi from ECOWAS, Bernard Mallet from Nas uh, Agence Nationale de la Recherche, Stefan Hafner from DLR in Germany, Christian Benik from FARA, and Dr. Mumini Savadogo from Waskal. Welcome, and I'm so happy that you're here with us in the first panel. Next slide, please. As Rose, Rose Omari already highlighted, we are inviting to our discussions uh, Dr. Wilhelmina Quay, Dr. Laila Lokosang, Marta Iglesias, Mauricio Raeli and Philippe petit Huguenin, together with Ibrahim Asante, if you have the chance to join. Thank you for, very much for being with us. Next slide, please. So um, what are the components we would like to discuss today? What are the starting points to launch a research and innovation collaboration in, in West Africa? Next slide, please. So the first thing we need for collaboration are topics for action. We have the FNSSA roadmap with the given topics. We have West African demand for knowledge. We have to identify now what are the main challenges in the region and what are the existing sub-regional and regional research and innovation agendas and programs in order to be able to integrate these topics. Next slide, please. Um, the next component is building FNSSA alliances upon existing networks. So today we invited actors with specific mandates and the position to form alliances. So we have um, uh, members here from, from Cora, from Wascal, from FARA. These are the people who are active in the region and who will hopefully help us to attract partners who are at the moment not represented in the active networks of the EU-AU partnership. Next slide, please. Um, one of the vehicles we hope to set up is that within an alliance, we jointly develop research models which address the sub-regional challenges. So it is the idea to jointly develop uh, theory of change and impact pathway, and to build the FNSSA alliance alongside to such a research model. The link which has to be made between research and practice, between the innovators and the researchers, the innovators who are in this panel today, um, has to be planned and put in place the key word we have here, which was already mentioned by 
Martauer, is the knowledge-based society. Knowledge here being the efficient use of information to react towards the constant change in our surrounding. Next slide, please. So the first component is presented by Dr. Hamidou Tambora and Dr. Sylvie Lewicki, together with Abdul Tenkwano and Irene Anno from Pong, Ernest Obi and Mumini Savadogo, together with Bernard Malé. We will see the presentations in a second. Um, next slide, please. Also, of course, um, Dr. Abdou Tenkwano and Irene Anor from Pong, together with Ernest Dobi and Dr. Mumini Savadog, will be actually showing us which are the innovative actors in the region and whom we can integrate into this initiative. Next slide, please. Uh, the next step and a common practice in Leap Agri is the development of a theory of change and impact pathways. And we will have Stefan Hafner and Christian Benik highlighting components of uh, developing such a theory of change and also the knowledge management around it. Next slide, please. So these two colleagues, Stefan Hafner and Christian Benik, will also be highlighting how we can link research and practice. Thanks a lot. Next slide, please. After the presentations, we invite you to have a discussion. We would like to ask you, as the panel members, what do you think about the idea to launch a West African chapter of the AU-EU partnership? And what are the selling points to launch West African FNN SSA alliances? What are the challenges to launch such an alliance? How should the actors be mobilized? Is it a good approach to mobilize actors along a joint research agenda? And what are the steps to be taken now from this point out to form the FNSSA Alliance? And maybe you would like to contribute other topics. The participants of this workshop are invited to contribute their questions via via Q&A. This is the timetable more or less we would like to take. Um, we will now start with the first presentation. So the first presentation will be given by uh, Dr. Hamidou Tambora and Sylvie Lewicki, who closely work together in West Africa. Dr. Hamidou Tambora is a senior animal science scientist in Burkina Faso, and he's the Director General of Research and Innovation for Development Funding Agency, FONRID. Dr. Sylvie Lewicki, I'm very happy that you're here as well. Sylvie Lewicki is a plant physiologist, and she's the Region Director of CIRAD in West Africa and for the dry zones region in Burkina Faso, Cap Verde, Gambia, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Senegal, and Chad. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. I would like to ask you to give your presentation. Thank you. Sorry, Hamidou, we cannot hear you. You have muted your microphone. Okay, now? Yes, there you are. Thank you very much. <laughs> so it's a very big pleasure to be with you today. And uh, by the end, we reach this meeting, this important meeting we are preparing for 
long, long weeks, long, long months, long years, I can say. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to present this, uh, these two or three slides, Sylvie and I, we have written. So it's uh, about Alliance of Sahel, Sahel Alliance, West Africa, a sort of network um, built in this region to enhance the cooperation between actors for fighting uh, constraints. So uh, I will begin with the context and uh, I will not be very large when saying that uh, major current issues in West African countries concern sustainable economic, social and environmental development. And as all of you are aware, past decades were really marked by exacerbation of security concerns. And I think that all of you are aware of this situation. As a response of this situation, a robust security military solution is currently being implemented. So you know what is called G5 style. It's a military alliance between Burkina Faso, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, and Chad, and backed by international community. This is a sort of main solution, but it appears that it cannot be a sufficient solution for the situation, this situation currently lived by populations. So, next please. In July 2017, France and Germany launched a joint initiative called the Alliance Sahel, which is fostering the coordination and efficiency of the main development aid donors operating in Sahel. And this was baked by some important multilateral players like World Bank, FDB, UNDP, and European Union, and their priority sectors were youth and employability and education, rural development, agriculture and food security, energy and climate, governance, decentralization, decentralization and basic service, and security. Next, please. So the main actors of this alliance were of three categories. You have NAS of T5, as I said previously, adding Senegal, which is not in the G5. And as regional major actors, you, are, you know them, they are participating at this meeting. You have ECOWAS, you have uh, Sahelian uh, Countries Network Fighting Drove, called SILS, you have Koraf we got a major one, and Waskal. And from the European side, you have from now CIRAD and IRD. Temporary secretary, secretary is uh, led by France IFD, responsible for implementation of the initiative. Next, please. So the objectives, the main commitments are conduct an initial joint analysis of the major issues related to common areas of expertise of participant, participating actors, to identify the main issues requiring high priority in terms of scientific investment, innovation and development support in the coming years, and to found an open coalition to serve as a scientific and technical backbone within the Sahel Alliance to respond adequately to the social, economic, and technical demand of agricultural and rural development for the benefit of rural populations. Next. 
So we identified some area of priorities in the, the, the area of these countries participating. And the main of them are support of territorial development, ecological intensification of all value chains, development of hydro agricultural schemes and of irrigated crops, pastoralism and animal health, next. Management of habitat and natural resources, deployment of sustainable food systems, and contributing to strengthen the capacities of stakeholders and to consolidate the research, the innovation support, and the agricultural and rural training institutions. That is the, the, the main areas these countries identified together. And here you have a slide illustrating all of them as I was uh, talking uh, previously, you have the international, the, the regional cooperator, and the national uh, participating stakeholders. So Sylvie will uh, follow up with the next presentation, I think. Thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry, I muted. Thank you very much, Hamidou. Sylvie, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, uh, webinar. It's very important to communicate and to know what happened in the, all the, the region. I have no presentation. We prepared this presentation with, uh, with Amidou. And uh, just a few words uh, to say, how is it important to consider this silent zone uh, particularly because uh, you, you know the, the problems and the, the security problems in here. Uh, uh, it's very different in the uh, humid zone of West Africa. And that's why we try to, to uh, to work with our partners together. It's very important for, for us to have a co-construction of the uh, recommendations for politics. And these eight recommendations uh, are very important, as you see, for example, you know, as, uh, you know that uh, livestock is very important for the silent zone and for food security. And uh, so it's a, it's a particular focus on our recommendations. Um, well, I'm pleased to, to respond to, 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 to further discussions. And uh, well, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sylvie Lewicki and Hamidou Tambora for this interesting presentation which from our point of view is very important because of course uh, it is our aim to build upon existing initiatives. Thank you very much. So as a next speaker, you already put on your video. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdu Tenkwano. He is the executive director of CORAF Kouraf is the West and Central African Council for Agriculture Research and Development. Dr. Abdou Tenkwano, he obtained an engineer of development rural degree from the University of Ouagadougou, a master of science in plant breeding and a PhD in genetics. We are very happy to have you here and please give us our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, my presentation has been pre-recorded and with your permission, I'll ask the technical team to just launch it. Thank you. Yes. 
I, is, oh yes, there it is coming. Thank you very much. It looks like there is no sound. Yes. Um, how, how do we do it? Would you like to, to present it? I could do it from my side if they do not have a way of finding the sound. So maybe we wait a second and if it doesn't work, we would like to ask you to present it. Okay, maybe if you can, you can just present it because we have the privilege to have you here. So maybe you can just present it. Um, I, I need the person who is sharing the screen to stop sharing so that I can share. Ah, okay. taking longer than expected. Yes, that's because we are all here virtually, right? Let me try and close a few windows from my side. And I should... The other option is that we show it and always just show the next slide if you tell us to do so. Okay, it's now coming. Okay. Do you have it? Yes, here it is. I can see it. Yes. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on the part of the world you're joining this uh, meeting from. My name is Abdul Tenkwono. I'm the executive director of CORAF. CORAF is the West and Central African Council for Agricultural Research and Development. I have the privilege of making a presentation today on the topic of food nutrition security and sustainable agricultural research demand in West Africa. I have to say up front that what we do in the region is uh, written in the form of a strategic plan for 2018 to 2027 after a very inclusive consultation with all our stakeholders. And uh, that strategy was adopted at uh, the General Assembly of Cora that was held. Uh, in April 2018 in Dakar, Senegal. You could see on the picture that all uh, our members who were present, uh, including the NARS from different parts of uh, West and Central Africa, but more importantly this time, for the first time, we had representative of governments, all the heads that are circled in yellow or in uh, red, are either ministers representing the governments of their countries or permanent secretaries of the ministries of these governments. We recognize upfront that agriculture is under pressure and we have a convergence that is unprecedented of multiple disruptors. On the demand side, we have pressure from population growth 
and urbanization we are changing lives. On the supply side, we have climate change with its effect on environmental degradation and uh, the development and uh, proliferation of biological uh, risks. All those are reducing the supply of food to the extent that per capita food availability has decreased in the region. Adding to these crises, we have the interactions that lead to conflict and uh, between different groups of stakeholders and migration. And all this is happening in the context of repeated global health crisis. We currently have COVID-19, we have had Ebola, and uh, this is probably not the end. I do not want to be a message of the doom, but uh, this is a picture that we have to recognize upfront. Our strategy is articulated around a number of priority intervention domains. The first one is to make sure that agriculture produces outputs that can assure security for food and nutrition. A number of levers are actioned and uh, without going into too much detail, it has to do with increased productivity it has to do with reducing the effect of climate change. It has to do with controlling pests. And it has to do with managing better water resources. The second priority has to do with policies, institutions, markets, and trade. We recognize increasingly that a lot of the production, if it could be processed to enhance value, then we would also be able to reduce some of the losses and gain access to markets with uh, good quality products. Uh, very important in this particular area is what we do in the area of uh, seed and uh, other agri inputs. It's extremely important that we have a mastery of uh, agri input delivery to our uh, main users, which are the growers. The third area where we are active is to ensure that all what we do lead to gender, youth, and social equity. Um, more than half of the production uh, of the producers are women. They have been disproportionately disadvantaged. It's important that we make corrections so that they also benefit from the dividends of agricultural growth. We recognize increasingly that our youth needs to be employed and employed decently, and the only area where there are opportunities these days is in supporting them through agricultural uh, products. Otherwise, the classical approach that we have to research are those that are known, improve biological yield by uh, working on the genetics, the physiology, improving biophysical efficiencies by natural resource management, reducing post-harvest losses so that we have a triple or four times more uh, production, but uh, more importantly, make sure that we have processing and value addition now, uh, taking care of all the losses so that we can diversify and add the value to our production. And that's probably where we can also bring in the youth employment and the gender equity aspects. However, we must recognize that risk management has become a major component of all what we do. And uh, it's not just the uh, core of recognizing it, it is something that is being increasingly taken at the international level that uh, everything that we do should be cognizant of risk because it is there to stay, unfortunately, for a long time. However, as we address risk and we respond to the immediacy of the action that are requested of us, we should not forget that we need to be able to not compromise preparedness for future shock and therefore build resilience. We, at the regional level, have agreed on one thing. We are not evolving in silos. What happens in one country affects what happens in another country. 
Therefore, the region has decided to turn the ideas of uh, the comprehensive agricultural, African agricultural uh, development program into a regional uh, framework through the development of what was called the West Africa Agricultural Productivity Program. What we did was to decide to develop a regional uh, discovery to delivery framework so that a particular country will work on what they have a comparative advantage for, not just for that country, but for the region as a whole. And everybody would be doing something that has value for others without us doing necessarily everything everywhere. So we coined the concept of National Center of Specialization, and there are nine of them that are active with ambition of creating a few more as we go forward. So we have dry cereals in Senegal, we have rice in Mali, we have livestock in Niger, fruits and vegetables in Burkina Faso, mangrove rice in Sierra Leone, plantain and banana in uh, Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire, roots and tubers in Ghana, uh, maize in uh, Benin, and uh, fisheries and aquaculture in Nigeria. The aim is to produce solutions that are scalable across borders, and for this, we have made sure that we have harmonized processes and uh, that uh, we have solutions that can be sold in what we call our technology market. We recognize that our research would have no impact unless we work with the small old farmer and uh, therefore all our intervention should be farmer centric. From the left hand side of this slide that shows what we need to work on uh, from high potential varieties to agroecology to agronomic performance to nutrition to market drivers, we recognize that the farmer should be at the center. I don't intend for you to read everything that is there, but just take note that everything that is in green is what we do with the farmer. Everything that is in yellow is what is done to support the farmer. And everything that is in pink is where we need to put a lot more emphasis to bring in essentially the private sector into supporting us to support the farmers. In other words, we need to make sure that we make our science to make sense, and that's why we work with the farmer organizations at the regional level, APES, RBM, ROPA, in, uh, among others. Finally, the condition for enhancing actors' cooperation, uh, we believe that we need to be uh, centered on partnerships. Without partnership, we can't achieve anything. This is an example of a situation where an organization that would be active in the region would have its activities based on its comparative advantage and we have government priorities and we have the founders of such activity. Ideally, uh, I would see that we have a more concentric uh, 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 convergence where the circles overlap a little more than what we have on the left hand side so that the area of common interest is increased so that partnership would mean what it really means, which is to do more together and less alone. Remember that the donors are aligning increasingly with the government priorities and that government themselves have national agricultural investment plans that are sometimes coalesced into regional agricultural investment plans. There will be no justification for any organization to be doing something in the region outside of the priorities of the government and the priorities of the resource partners that are aligned more and more with those of the government. If there is a single message I would like to leave, that's the one. Let us work together. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Henning. This is my presentation and I would like to thank all of you for inviting me to be part of this, uh, uh, this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, from my personal point of view, with your last statement, more together than alone, we can now actually end this session. <laughs> but don't worry, we will go on. <laughs> Thank you very much.
for this very interesting presentation, which shows where we can actually link in if we want to mobilize partners in the region. I now invite Dr. Irene Anor Frampong for the next presentation. She, we, we all know her that she has been the director for research and innovation in FARA, the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. She currently serves as an advisor in research and innovation, and she has a PhD from the veterinary school in Bristol. So please, Irene, I invite you to give your next presentation. I'm very happy that you're here. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Moderator. I think we are trying to share our screen. Um, let me know if you, you, you see it. We can see it now. Okay. So um, good afternoon, good morning to everyone, depending on where you are. I'm pleased to be part of this um, very important and long awaited um, dialogue. I'm excited uh, also to hear from my colleagues in, in Accra, um, particularly uh, from CSIR. Um, I will try and focus on the agenda because Christian will come in with a bit more detail on the partnerships um, that um, we, we work with. So if my screen should move, So, but I'm not seeing it move here. There's a technical. It, it is moving. <laughs> okay. Uh, but so, I think so there's a delay. The... Okay. Okay. The delay is very long. So, so you have the outline on now at the moment. I have the outline. Okay, so four, five key areas um, is to really explain what the science agenda is not. And now I've gone overboard. And um, to look at what it is. to look at a bit of the genesis because I don't know who is joining. Um, and then look at the process and uh, particularly focus on the agenda that we have and how countries have mainstreamed or are working on the science agenda and make some concluding um, remarks. So now I don't know what you're seeing and what I'm seeing. I think there's a time delay. Um, you see the outline. That's you see the outline. outline. Okay, so that's the outline. Go next. So can, can somebody manage this so I see what they are seeing? Because I'm not seeing it. Okay. So what, what is the science agenda? It is important to acknowledge that the science agenda is a framework that identifies best bet um, science-based options, uh, technology, extension, innovation, policy, and social learning, and basically for transforming African food and agriculture. It identifies, of course, strategic, but also high-level actions that help us to make contributions of science um, better contribute to agriculture. So it's a framework for global partnerships in science uh, for agriculture in Africa. So I think that's how we need to remember or see the, the science agenda. What the science agenda is not, is that it is not um, an agricultural science agenda for Africa. 
but rather it is the application of a wide array of scientific disciplines, ICT and non-scientific disciplines as contributing to agriculture on the continent. So it is not a technical, about technical excellence alone um, that guarantees a successful adoption of the science agenda. Also, it is not an exhaustive document uh, that is guiding uh, and enhancing science um, to agriculture. But also remember that it's not a quick fix. The science agenda is a long-term transformation framework. And that is why it's important to see it within the context of the Leap for FNSSA as a long-term partnership. It's important to also recall that the science agenda is based on principles that help us to implement the so-called framework for African agricultural productivity, which was the main hallmark for CADA pillar four during um, the first phase of CADA. And six key messages are important. One about ensuring that there's commitment um, to strengthening the, the role uh, of science Second, uh, that the science ag for agriculture is just too important for Africa to outsource, meaning that Africa must generate its own domestic resources and capabilities to implement uh, what it requires. And then also as science is a critical preser preserver and use of the rich bioresources bio and that Af African agricultural transformation will not happen uh, without the potential of women and youth. So the emphasis of people that we, we heard about earlier on from the EC, and that um, the time to increase investment is in science is more important now than even before. Um, because if we have to leapfrog to join the rest of the world, uh, we need to make the relevant investments. And then the last key point is that um, when it comes to the application of science, African solidarity in science really should be the underpinning strategy to harness the power of science. So these are the, if, if you don't remember anything at all, these are the key things that um, should be remembered uh, in terms of the agenda. The agenda itself was commissioned or authorized by the African Union Commission and and NEPAD, now the AUDA, uh, that mandated FARA uh, that is working with the SROs, CADESA, ASEREKA, CORAP, NASRO. I'm excited to hear from Dr. Tenkuano, this, this uh, just before me, in terms of the detail that at sub regional level uh, guides the prioritization of um, science uh, research and innovation. Um, then to mention that it's important to see that the science agenda was developed as an African owned uh, process and therefore was predicated on a number of um, consultations. So what have we done to date? Uh, very quickly, I'm going to fly through this. Uh, initiated from Dublin as um, a CADAP CGIR alignment uh, program. It then um, got uh, commissioned in 2012, uh, methodologies developed, uh, it got um, a lot of sub-regional consultations, endorsements in 2014 by the ministerial, and finally at the, at the summit. Uh, in 2014, it's important that this agenda was ratified at the same time that the Malabo declaration was ratified and then was launched in Johannesburg uh, the, the same year, 2015. Important uh, point where all African partners, over 100, I think 120 different partners coming together to define what the implementation strategy should be. We called it Walk the Talk. A financing proposal in 2017 um, spearheaded by IFAD in Rome and then in Washington, uh, the World Bank spearheading uh, financial uh, building institutional arrangement for its implementation. In 2017, uh, more country level consultations to define theories of change. And of course, the 
AU specialized technical committee's decision for all countries to implement the science agenda to which a number of countries already responded. So what's the contribution in framing agendas? The science agenda, as many will recall, has contributed to overall to the sustainable development goals. But on the continent, it contributes directly to agenda 2063 through, first of all, the CADAP uh, Malabo, as I indicated, but also to the STISA um, that defines the strategy for science, technology, and innovation in Africa. It also has contributed directly to the Feed Africa program defined by the Africa Development Bank, and of course, contributed to the LIF, LIF for FNSSA through its contribution to uh, the EU-AU partnership. I think this is the context within which the science agenda is important. And of course, it contributed to the national uh, agriculture investment programs, starting of course from the, 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 the FAP, but also in its own right, uh, linking up with national productivity programs and national programs, including CGIR and other international agriculture research uh, centers. All these have become partners uh, that we rally around when we, we discuss and talk about or implement the science agenda. Uh, AGRA, AATF uh, are all partners of importance. The slide gives a little bit more of detail. So you see there are seven themes or priority themes of the science agenda, uh, four main ones, three cross-cutting. You will see the uh, quick alignment between those priority areas and those of the EU uh, AU partnership on food nutrition security or sustainable agriculture, particularly on sustainable intensification, agriculture food systems for nutrition and expansion and improvement of markets and trade. So I think I, this is the, the entry point for, for this discussion. And again, the science agenda ultimately wants to establish by 2020 that Africa is food and nutrition secure. So that's again, a linkage to the FNSSA. So Africa, this is um, an area that we share with, um, with Europe. By 2025, we are hoping to double productivity, halve post-harvest losses, triple inter-African trade, and move um, household resilience to climate change by about 30%. Those are huge um, um, expectations. Um, but there are important intervention areas that also define other priorities as well, um, including uh, strengthening uh, systems um, for, for, for agriculture by sustaining um, basic capacity at national level enhancing regional and global uh, collaboration, which again is important because issue about partnership and co collaboration is something that has been an um, under achievement over, over, over the years. And of course, knowledge management. Secondly, to strengthen sustainable financing, another elephant in the room. And um, of course, creating a favorable policy environment um, to ensure that we achieve this agenda. The institutional arrangement and partnership, um, I want to stress because we're talking about alliances and partnership. At the national level, we define a national agriculture innovation uh, system, including all the actors you see around the, the NARIS, National Agriculture Research Institutions. We're engaging with universities, advisory services, producers, including private sector, agribusinesses, policymakers. But I need to mention that in the context of the science agenda, we've already started with uh, Ghana and Benin, who were the first to respond to the STC, AU STC uh, directive of implementing the science agenda. So all these players are to be mobilized if we want to coordinate properly um, research and innovation. But at the supranational level, we also uh, have key partners um, I call them the Science for Agriculture Consortium. Now we're calling ourselves the CADAP XP4 partners. 
uh, working, of course, with the CGIR and other uh, research institutions. The, the, the CADAPEX P4 or the Science for Agriculture Consortium, of course, includes all the supranational institutions, particularly FARA, AFAS, CADESA, CORAF, uh, ASAREKA, and NASRO. Um, again, the hallmark of the science agenda, as I said, was to have it African owned and driven. So it was predicated on a lot more consultations when it came to the implementation. 40 countries uh, contributed to um, the consultations for implementation. And the outcome of these consultations actually contributed to the current Horizon Europe um, um, agenda. So it's important that um, we don't have time to show this, but I just wanted to mention it. We went further detail to look at the a certain number of countries where we are looking deep into what they are doing. For West Africa, um, as I said, Ghana and Benin uh, are important in this. And the strategy is to what we learn from, from these two countries to other countries. So the two main components of implementing at country level, we are entering through mainstreaming the science agenda as part of the CADA process and therefore part of the binary review and sector-wide processes at country level. But also we are implementing through prioritization and implementation of specific flagship programs. Um, particularly those that substantially contribute to CADA um, research and innovation programs that are demand driven, those that mobilize uh, STI, but also partnerships to achieve the targets we are looking for, and initiatives that employ uh, proven tools and um, approaches. So the science agenda actually um, identifies and aligns with all these initiatives in order to drive um, or implement the framework. So when a country is part of a science agenda, it starts from the AU level and it commits uh, to an AU developed um, framework. And then it does take stock taking. It uh, looks, develops the program that's linked to the CADA, national CADA process. And then it looks at processes for strengthening the institutional structures. And then of course it implements those actions learns lessons and monitors and then does social marketing. But that is not as important or is equally important to the pathways that countries take to implement the science agenda. And there are four value add areas. Now this slide is also not meant for you to go through everything, but to indicate that for each of the value add areas, there's a pathway depending on the country to arrive at the outcomes of the science agenda. The first value add area of the science agenda at country level is to support planning, prioritization, uh, and implementation. And the number of processes and methodologies that countries would adopt. Second area is strengthening coherence. Again, a number of processes, but key to that is how we um, map all the initiatives based on the seven priority areas that the science agenda had identified. And the third value add is of course the advocacy and strategies for um, evidence-based advocacy. Again, a number of uh, pathways, particularly strengthening the science policy uh, interface and of course, knowledge management for decision support. And then the last point is the last value add area is on resource mobilization. So if a country is implementing uh, the science agenda, they have the support to mobilize resources to increase investment. And this is domestic investment, both changing the budget architecture, as well as also seeking other um, donor financing at the national level to support the implementation of the science agenda you will see that cross-cutting to all this is what is important for this discussion. The issue of partnerships, multi-stakeholder partnerships, innovation platforms, we, we know that, but also the capacities to plan and implement uh, the, the, the roadmap that the science agenda at a particular country level is um, formulated. 
and of course using that to influence international cooperation. So I will leave this at that um, slide because um, there's a lot more to have um, discussed. Then my last point is what are the expected outcomes of um, this framework? Um, of course, we, we know and are expecting that at country level, um, investments in STI should be increased um, if the science agenda is implemented, as well as showing better returns on those investments. Um, increases in capacity for planning and implementation, as I mentioned, providing the enabling um, policies strengthening the interface between science and policy, that we have better integrated uh, programs and better reporting of national targets. Why is that important? Because that is what is going to help us to change the budget, uh, the, the budget architecture in favor of science and technology. Oftentimes you go to a country, you see that the, the, the national research and uh, national research <laughs> center is implementing a lot of programs, and yet the budget that's given to uh, that ministry is so small. It's amazing how that is happening. So it's important that we report properly and we are coherent to show at national level the returns on the investment for us to elicit higher uh, investment and incomes. So th these are big um, areas that we think that the science agenda at country level should um, elicit. So what are the next steps? And this is my last slide. Um, that to say that the need, there's a need to strengthen coordination of research innovation at national level is an understatement. This is the bane and has been the bane for all that we have done over years to deepen the application of science. We need to talk about how research and innovation is coordinated at country level in Africa. Of course, it is informed by um, resources and by the partnerships we have with Europe, with, with US and, and other key international partners. So in any international cooperation discourse, Africa must put on the table how we coordinate at national level. It is a policy issue. And because of that, it is also a financing issue. And we think that any partnership with Europe must consider this. And I, I heard Philippe when he was making his point that um, this dialogue must contribute to the platform that Leap for FNSSA wishes to put in place. This should be um, the, 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 the key point for us to discuss how you strengthen the African side in terms of coordinating research at country level. And second area is to build the innovation partnerships uh, for agenda setting. I have said often when we were talking at Horizon Europe um, initial meeting, agenda setting itself is a priority theme for Africa. Different countries are adopting different uh, ways of prioritization. And I know that Leaf for F and SSA has, is making an attempt to look at how um, prioritization is going on. I think FARA itself has launched a mapping study, and we want to understand very well how we support countries to institutionalize multi-stakeholder partnerships that will help agenda setting on a continuous basis in the long term. And then, of course, resource mobilization itself, as I said, nobody's going to change Africa's research and innovation. At best, as the science agenda says, we will borrow intelligently from global partnerships. But Africa has to make sure that our budget architecture favors science and technology to enable us to do, to do, to do this creditably. And of course, finally, to strengthen the evidence-based advocacy, strengthening the, the science policy interface. We, through the science agenda, has initiated the um, science, the policy practice index, which I think some countries are going to start. The SROs are taking charge of that now. And we hope that that will also form some other alliances around research and innovation, particularly at the policy level, which I think is a, a key element to whatever alliance that we want to form. So um, colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, 
let me stop here and maybe Christian will touch more on the details of the partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Irene Anno Frampong, for this very comprehensible presentation. I would now like to invite Ernest Obi, Head of Agriculture Division at the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, at the Commission in Abuja. Um, Ernest Obi, he has been working in senior management positions in international organizations for a very long time. And he is an expert in agriculture, rural development, poverty alleviation, and sustainable development. So please, Ernest Obi, may I ask you for your presentation? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, can they load my presentation? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can we go to the next to the next slide? Okay, um, thank you very much. On behalf of the ECOWAS Commission, I were very pleased to be part and parcel of this very important um, dialogue. Um, I was asked by the organizer to talk on the topic from national policies to regional agricultural investment plan for food and nutrition security. And I will be giving the ECOWAS perspective experience. Um, you can see quickly, I'll talk on the objectives, key elements of the investment plans, priorities, challenges, um, and some of the strategies and key actors that we work with. And finally, I look uh, at the way forward. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Um, basically, the ECOWAP objective, ECOWAP is the ECOWAS agriculture policy. It is the key policy that guides agricultural development and transformation at the ECOWAS Commission and also in the community of uh, 15 West African states. And basically the objective is to uh, meet the food and nutritional needs of the population, economic and social development and poverty elevation. And out of this global uh, objective, we have four specific objectives which hinges on the following, to improve agroforestry, pastoral and fisheries productivity. We also want to promote an inclusive and competitive agriculture and food value chain uh, in the region. We want to improve access to food and nutrition. And also, as was well said by earlier speakers, resilience for vulnerable population. And we want to improve the business environment and governance for the agriculture and food sector, because uh, agriculture is not no longer a way of life, but a business. Next slide. Now, um, based on the, the um, information I got from the organizers, I would now want to move on the key elements of the National Agriculture Investment Plan. As was said by uh, the direct executive director of CORA, um, the region, has a regional agricultural investment plan, which covers cross-cutting issues uh, like agricultural research, climate change, trade, et cetera. But also each of the 15 member states have their national agricultural investment plan. This is in line with the CADE process. Now, what are some of the key elements in the plan investment plans for our member states is that we operate on the principles of subsidiarity solidarity and complementarity. We want to encourage participatory and consultative process of prioritization. And the, the national plans are owned by the respective membership. So there must be national ownership and national priorities. And the National Agriculture Investment Plan is anchored on the CADEP, the ECOWAP, the Agenda uh, 2063 and the bigger global agenda, which is the SDGs. And we also, in the plan, uh, promote partnership to a comprehensive compact between all the uh, national development act actors, including um, development partners. Now, what are 
the priorities of the Regional Agricultural Investment Plan. We want to com combat hunger and malnutrition. We want to address issues of climate change. We want to strengthen resilience for food and nutrition insecurity. We want to promote employment amongst our youths and women in particular. Next slide. Next slide. All we, as part of our priority at the regional level, we want to promote uh, systematic gender mainstreaming in all agricultural policies, strategies, plans, and, uh, uh, and programs. We want to also uh, uh, develop a, comp a competitive and inclusive value chain. We, we have adopted the value chain approach. This is very important to be able to add value to the commodities that we produce so that we can create job opportunities, enhance our national and regional economies. Uh, we also have realized that agriculture is not just farming. It cuts across a whole range of sectors, trade, macroeconomy, uh, industry, etc., and we want to promote that intersectoral collaboration. And also, another priority area is to upgrade the agricultural information system in the region. Next slide. Now, in terms of the challenges, I will go quickly because uh, um, uh, Dr. Abdul, the ED of CORAF, mentioned uh, most of them, but I would give four key challenges. One is the issue of food uh, insecurity and sovereignty in the region with growing uh, uh, malnutrition levels in the population that we are witnessing. We also have the challenge of modernizing our family farms. We are still, um, despite the good work done by CORAF, uh, the National Agricultural Research Institutes and other organizations, we are still uh, not adopting uh, the technologies uh, uh, to improve production and productivity. So we need to modernize family farms, including the provision of inputs, extension and advisory services. Um, we also want to, another challenge is the issue of intensification, uh, um, which has not been done. We tend to concentrate more of extensification, covering larger areas uh, as opposed to uh, using uh, efficiently a smaller area and increase the productivity. The issue of climate change is also very critical for the enhancement of our production systems. And uh, we want to have uh, an efficient labor intensive value chain in the, in, in the region. Because as I said in earlier, uh, there's a lot of drudgery in our production systems. Now, what are some of the key programs, strategies and actors? Uh, one of them is the ECOWAS Rights Offensive Program. We have the West African Agriculture Transformation Program, uh, which is the incoming program to the West African Ag uh, Agriculture uh, Production and Productivity Program, WAP, which uh, is housed or domiciled in Korab. We have the Fisheries Governance Program. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. We also have a livestock development program. We have an agriculture and nutrition resilience project. This one we're working uh, with SEALs and the European Union. We had a food flies control project, which ended the second phase is about to start. We also have worked on um, the, fall, the fall army worm with other development partners, uh, the ECOWAS food reserve program, and also the Zero Hunger Initiative. We worked on this project uh, with the German government and FAO. Um, in short, over the last 10 years up to date, we've had over 50 interventions uh, implemented during ECOWAP 1 and also during the current phase of ECOWAP. Next slide. Now, who are the key actors? Uh, for an organization like the ECOWAS Commission, we have many, many actors. And if I want to go uh, to, if I want to name them individually, it will take a long time. So I've just classified. We have the ECOWAS member states, which you have 15 of them. We have farmer-based organizations, such as um, uh, ROPA. We have the private sector. 
which includes the Chamber of Commerce, the civil society organizations, the, which includes the NGOs, the media, uh, women's uh, organizations like the West African Women's Association based in Dakar. We have development partners. Uh, some are based in the continent and some are outside side, uh, the region, but also our development partners are not just only those who provide money. Our development partners include technical organizations like uh, COGAF is a development partner to ECOWAS, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FARA, and a host of others are also considered are, or are part and parcel of our development partners. And of course, we have a very dynamic ECOWAS, uh, ECOWAP uh, donors group that is very, very dynamic, currently chaired by France. Uh, we have regional, uh, national, and also international, uh, international agricultural research centers. Some of them are domiciled in West Africa, uh, like CORAF, like IITA, like Africa RISE. And we also have regional and continental organizations like the African Union Commission, of course, uh, NEPAD uh, agency. Now, in terms of strategies, what are some of the strategies that we adopt in the implementing of our national and regional plans, agricultural investment plans for food and nutrition security? Uh, earlier speakers touched on them, and I will just go quickly. We develop partnership strategies, signing of MOUs. We have a coordination um, mechanism uh, for all our projects and programs, like we have very active steering committees, regional steering committees, technical committees that meet regularly. We also do a lot of resource mobilization. And when I say resource, it's not just money, but the, 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 the technical, the technology, the technical aspect is also considered as very important resources. We do a lot of knowledge management to share the experiences to capitalize on some of the best practices. M&E is another strong component that we have. In fact, we have a whole active M&E unit in the, uh, in, the, in the Directorate of Agriculture and Rural Development. We also key into the CADE processes like the biennial review, which requires mutual accountability or the Paris uh, Declaration on Accountability. We also do a lot of collaboration in terms of technology transfers so that we don't waste time and try to reinvent what has already been developed. Next slide. Now, in terms of way forward, very quickly, we are advocating for uh, increased investment in ag agriculture based on the, on the commitments that African governments have made from uh, Maputo to Malabo. Uh, we want to scale up proven agricultural technologies in the region. We've got a lot developed by CORAF, developed by various national agricultural systems in a whole lot of commodity value chains. We are also promoting uh, the implementation of social protection programs to mitigate the impact of COVID-19, climate change. Earlier on, we had the problems of Ebola. Um, we are also promoting regional trade in food commodities uh, through a food reserve program that is up and running, which has been very, very instrumental in meeting some of the food needs of uh, our member states during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic period. We are also promoting value chain development to create employment opportun opportunities for the youths and women so our youths can stay on the continent and have a fulfilled uh, life in in, uh, in the agricultural sector. And finally, we are also promoting agriculture as a business. Um, in this regard, we're working with the chambers of commerce um, and various private sector organizations so that um, they invest in agriculture because uh, the returns in agriculture um, are very, very good and to create jobs and also contribute towards political stability and the development of um, the West African region. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, um, I had to run through very quickly the slides so as to save time and give other presenters uh, time to make their own statements. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. This was very impressing how you, in such a short time, gave us this vast overview of the activities. I'm very pleased the way it is structured because on this we can build. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask the next presenter, Bernard Mallet from ANR in France. Uh, presently, Bernard is the coordinator of Leap Agri, and he's also working Leap for FNSSA. He has been working with uh, CIRAD before, and he has a lot of experience in uh, agroforestry systems, also especially in, in, in tropical regions. Bernard Mali, please give us your presentation. Well, th <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Henning, for your introduction, and thank you to, uh, thanks to Rose for the moderation. Uh, so it's a pleasure for us to join this uh, meeting uh, and uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here. So our uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we, we are uh, been preparing this presentation with Amidou Tambura from Conrad Burkina Faso. And we will focus our presentation on the funding networks and mechanisms to support the EU-AU FNSSR research on the innovation. Um, as it has been indicated by the previous speakers, uh, and more specifically Irene and Ernest, uh, uh, mobilizing resources is a key point to support uh, uh, key point to support uh, um, research on innovation in agricultural activity. Next slide, please. So there is a very large network of funders. So this uh, presentation is, uh, doesn't intend to be an exhausting one and to give all information, but it's just uh, to show that there is, there is a lot of organizations which are involved in uh, research and innovation in agricultural activities funding. And just looking at this, we could see that there are a lot of organizations, uh, national uh, a funding organization, as an example, Fundraid in Burkina Faso on ANR in France, as an example, at national level. There is a lot of non-EU funding agencies uh, from the United States of America, from uh, Japan, China, from Brazil, and uh, many other countries. But we have also some uh, big private foundations. We know, of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is uh, funding a lot of activities. We have also uh, companies which are involved in uh, funding. Uh, there are some big companies such as Danone or Nestle, but in most countries, small and medium national enterprises are uh, funding activities in relation with innovation. I would also uh, insist on the development banks uh, such as for Africa, the African Development Bank, the World Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, the Agence Française de Développement, which are also involved in the funding um, of such activities. But uh, we see also that uh, many funding agencies are joining forces to form funding alliances. Uh, part of them uh, uh, are uh, involved in agricultural activities such as the Belmont, the CLUA, the GAIN, and uh, so on. EU funding is also quite uh, important. And so, so we will come back to, to this. So the objective of this uh, very large presentation was not to give detailed information, but just to show that there is a very broad ecosys funding ecosystem. And I would come back to what has been said by uh, our colleague Irene from FARA, there is a need to uh, increase mo uh, funding mobilization, but at the same time, we need also to have some coordination to avoid each uh, funding agency doing its uh, activities by itself. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, coming to, uh, to a case study in Burkina Faso, which has been conducted uh, with uh, our colleague uh, Hamidou Tambura, we could see that uh, at the country level, there is also a lot of funding uh, uh, organizations which are 
funding FNSSR research on the innovation. Coming to the work in FSO case, of course, there is national uh, structures, so that's the funding and ministries, but many other uh, organizations are, are funding. And so we come now to, to the question of alignment, of coordination, which has already been uh, uh, questioned. So there is a need to have a very good coordination, good alignment, so, so that uh, all uh, funding agencies could work in the uh, uh, as possible in close cooperation. And we know that is not so evident uh, at uh, some time. Next slide, please. Another point, so there is a very large variability in research and innovation project identification and selection mechanism within funders. Some funders are working on a call for proposal basis. Some other funders are targeting some specific topics or organization. So it's quite variable. The funding schemes are quite diverse depending on funders' rules and priorities. Some uh, funders are interested in loans, some others are in much more in grants, some are targeting uh, NGOs, some others are targeting uh, national research organizations. And of course, we have seen that there are also some funders' alliances to support uh, FNSSR research and, inno and innovation. So it's a very large. Uh, um, as, uh, a uh, very broad uh, situation. Next slide, please. We will focus a bit more on the EU-AU FNSSR partnership funding. And so uh, this uh, map is trying to present uh, the various uh, European Union and European Commission tools, which uh, could be a uh, focus for uh, FNSSR activities. Part of this uh, uh, funds are coming from the what is called the DG DEFCO, so they are much more targeted to development, but we'll come back to this. And we can see uh, ASK uh, funding uh, budget lines, the uh, European Develop Development Fund, which is a big uh, uh, provider of funds. There is also the DESIRA, which is a more innovative fund, and we will come back on this. But we have also a lot of uh, other uh, uh, funding coming uh, from the Euro European Commission, and which are targeted to uh, Africa research and innovation activities, such as the Sustainable Food Security African Union Research Grants, the LIPAGRI uh, uh, project, the PRIMA project. So there is a very large ecosystem. It could be uh, difficult for some uh, uh, research organization or some uh, innovators to find a way to connect to uh, the interesting budget line. Next slide, please. So we, uh, we will then focus on some AU EU partnership alliance to support FNSSR research and innovation. And uh, I will take uh, two of them as an example. Uh, the first one will be the LIPAGRI Aeronet Coffin project. And the second one will be the, the DESERA initiative. So, so that way we could uh, understand a bit more how the, this is functioning. Next slide, please. Well, what is a uh, LIPAGRI? LIPAGRI is a, a joint project involving 30 African and European funders and program owners. And uh, this is very uh, interesting uh, as uh, we have in this uh, big uh, project, uh, 24 funding agencies, uh, from Africa, such as uh, from uh, uh, European countries with an EC support. And uh, this uh, big project uh, uh, facilitated the funding of 27 large projects. Next slide, please. Uh, as you, uh, you can see, well, it, it's a very brief information, but the 27 co-funded projects have been selected. Each project uh, is involving both African research team and European research team, which is something quite interesting. The total budget was 22 million euros, but as you can see, there is a great variability in topics, and there have been a process to 
identify the key topics. It was a joint Africa Europe uh, process. And thereafter, there was a call for proposal. And at the end, this project was selected. And they're uh, covering a large uh, diversity of, of topics relevant for uh, African agricultural activity. Next slide, please. As you can see, uh, more than 160 African and European research team were involved in this project. And from many countries and coming to West Africa, you can see there, were, there is team from Burkina Faso, from Ghana, from Senegal, from Benin. So this is, this is a, a quite interesting for each uh, um, funding agency, this funding team from its country, so African uh, funding agencies are funding African teams, European uh, uh, countries are funding their teams. And this is quite, uh, this shows the, the diversity and the uh, good cooperation between the, all the funding agencies and all the, the research team. Next slide, please. So uh, the second alliance we would like to present is uh, what is called, uh, it has been created a few years ago it's uh, called the Development Smart Innovation through Research in Agriculture, DESIRA. And the objective, the, uh, as you can see, is to foster innovation through research to contribute to transformation of agricultural and food systems in low and middle income countries. So this is much more focused to innovation and not specifically to, uh, to uh, uh, research, but it's uh, joining research and innovation to support uh, agricultural de development. Next slide. So this is uh, an, an alliance uh, within the European Commission some, uh, and some uh, EU members, uh, such as France, Germany, Belgium, Italy, the Netherlands. I will not give all the list. But during the last uh, three years, you can see that more than 70 projects uh, have been selected for funding and more than 300 million euros have been uh, allocated to, to fund this project. So this is a, an interesting uh, alliance, which is specifically dedicated to innovation, to support agricultural development in uh, developing countries. And we were with a great fo focus uh, on, on uh, Africa. Next slide, please. So the, uh, just a few uh, points also coming to DESIRA. So the objective the, is not only to support projects for research and innovation, but also to contribute to the governance and agricultural research. And we had the previous presentation uh, from FARA, from uh, various organizations. So one of the objectives of this uh, DESIRA initiative is also to support the global governance of agricultural research in, uh, in Africa, in, 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 come back to the question of coordination, which had been uh, indicated by our colleague Irene. Next slide, please. So I will be before uh, ending my presentation. I will just to remind that uh, Europa and Africa are sharing concerns and are sharing challenges. Uh, both continents are under big uh, environmental pressures, including climate change and so on. Both continents uh, are under uh, uh, pressures for resources and energy. Both continents uh, are under a very big uh, population dynamic, uh, uh, demography, and, and so on. Both countries, both continents are under uh, economic uh, pressures. So we, we are sharing between Europe and Africa, a lot of challenges. And food security and food system are linked with all these challenges of demography and environment and economy. So just to keep in mind that the, uh, our common future is very linked between Africa and Europe. Next slide, please. One of the conclusion, and as we are part of this LEAP for FNSSR project, uh, what is the objective of this Leap for FNSSA project? It is really to build a long-term Africa-Europe partnership platform to support long-term food and uh, nutrition and security research and, and innovation. 
Of course, uh, funders are only a part, one part of the global uh, one part of this global partnership platform. Uh, presentation indicated the importance of program owners, of uh, research organizations, of farmers and consumers associations, and, and so on. But of course, uh, funders are also key partners uh, in such a pat partnership platform elaboration. And it's also a funder's network responsibility to contribute to such a partnership platform and also to try to coordinate and to align uh, as most as possible uh, for better impact uh, and better long-term impact on uh, uh, agriculture and food security uh, uh, within Africa. So this is a very key leap for FNSSA challenge and we hope that during the next uh, uh, two years uh, we could jointly succeed to build up such a, a very uh, Africa-Europe partnership platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bernard Malé, for this insight. Um, I, I, I'm rushing to get to Stefan Hafner for the next presentation. Stefan Hafner is a geographer and he has a vast experience in international collaboration and he serves the DLR in Germany. Stefan, please, your presentation. Thank you very much, Henning, for the introduction and also thanks uh, to the speakers before me and also thanks uh, for the participants here, around 100 participants, that's great. Good to have you all here. Thank you very much. Uh, and also thanks for the slides, here they are. Uh, so please move already uh, to the next slide. My name is Stefan Hafner, as Henning said. I'm from the German Aerospace Center serving the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. I'm a Leap for FNSSA partner and I'm coordinating um, a, a work package in Leap for FNSSA. Leap for FNSSA initiates um, the co-design of an AU-EU partnership platform for research and innovation in FNSSA. And this includes a mechanism and its coordination for the exchange between science and end users of science in Africa and Europe. And as a contribution to this platform, it is suggested to develop a so-called um, sorting house mechanism, which is a preliminary term and it might be disputable. So like in new public management and governance approaches, um, it is the inclusion of stakeholders that matters. And therefore, uh, building a long-term mechanism for science end-user dialogues and developing a coordination infrastructure as the platform for research and innovation activities, this could only be done if we work together. And in that sense, uh, the spirit of co-production here is key and we should take this very seriously. The next slide, please. Um, in too many cases, scientists do not know about the need of uh, the end users so that their research does not serve them. Stakeholders furthermore might not have access to research outputs or they do not understand their meaning for their activities. Funders of research and innovation are not sufficiently informed uh, about the research that is needed for dedicating their funds in a need oriented way. And this is all not new for you. Uh, we know that. Uh, and that is where the suggested sorting house mechanism starts. And before we come more into some details of the sorting house mechanism, let's first have a look um, to these end users of knowledge that we mean here. In the next slide, please, you will see um, for um, the next slide, please. Can I have the next slide? Thank you very much. Um, there you see uh, four geographical dimensions um, and in all each of these dimensions there are end users of science. So in the dark green one, this is uh, the, the local uh, sphere um, of our region, Africa and Europe. And there uh, we have as end users, of course, the farmers and entrepreneurs. We have um, end users in food markets, NGOs institutions for capacity building, and we have uh, decision makers in communities and cities, 
and we have research and innovation institutions. Also research institutions are end users of science, even though that they also produce scientific output. And the um, innovation institutions are, and I don't want to list them all here now, um, these are uh, extension services or technology transfer offices, innovation centers, and so on and so forth. So the next dimension, the geographical dimension, is uh, the national um, dimension. There we have to deal with 82 countries, as you know, um, and uh, international relations there. Programs and projects are ongoing. And on the next level, we call this the multi-country level. Uh, this is the place where the African regional economic communities are active. And fortunately, we had here an excellent uh, presentation from our colleague uh, from ECOWAS, as well as from CORAF. They are active there in this, we call it the multi-country um, dimension, uh, geographical dimension. Uh, the next level is then, of course, um, the continental and the bicontinental um, dimension. That's the place where the African Union uh, and European Union high-level policy dialogue takes place, as well as continental and bicontinental programs, projects, um, and so on and so forth. And there are uh, also FARA is active. We heard already also a very impressive presentation from Irene Amor-Frempong here. So um, the sorting house mechanism shall foster circular dialogues between those uh, stakeholders. And therefore it is suggested um, to organize a sorting house mechanism in a way to have a sorting house hub for the continental bicontinental level, several sorting house hubs on the multi-country level, on the national 82 uh, sorting house hubs and then the local level as much as are needed. Um, so um, in the next slide, please. Um, the, the questions that we would like uh, to raise with you here, and this is not exhaustive, of course. Um, for example, instead of research in ivory towers or research as a, as a one-way road uh, to end users, the question is, what means co-production in the field of research and innovation? And a bit more concrete, how could a researcher and a farmer collaborate so that both formulate relevant research questions together and that farmers could benefit from science? How could a scientist collaborate with different decision makers in prioritization processes? Which channels, methods, technologies could foster communication between science and end users and serve upscaling and outscaling processes? So we should be very clear here. Co-production is about sustainability and consensus building that we need. The partnership as such counts in the same way as the outputs and the outcomes of certain activities. So in that sense, top-down processes for a short period of time and instant outputs are neither helpful nor sustainable. What we need are answers about um, how we can systematically co-develop a collaboration and how to support um, mechanisms towards a partnership platform which serves the actors today and in the future. And that's why we are here as the Leap for FNSSA project. We have several other project um, questions also. Um, for example, how can we institutionalize learning uh, in program and innovation collaboration cycles? And how can we assess impact of the collaboration? So what is important, we should build on those approaches uh, that exist. And again, we heard already here impressive uh, presentations uh, from the uh, colleagues from FARA, from CORAF and uh, from ECOWAS um, for fostering these um, inclusive uh, circular communication um, mechanisms. So let us understand the co-design process of this envisaged platform is rather a kind of negotiation towards a collaboration mechanism. And it is about building a kind of knowledge management and communication framework. So what does Leap for FNSSA suggest uh, for the West African uh, Alliance now? In the next slide, please, you see um, a, a, a draft, an, an, an image 
um, about the theory of change and impact pathway, we suggest to develop a general West African theory of change and impact pathway. And as I heard already in the last presentations, with regard to the first step, the situation analysis, there is already a lot of information, collected information, and um, the suggestion from LIFO FNSSA is to put that together and to uh, co-design in a second step uh, roadmaps, which will include um, agendas uh, for research and innovation and capacity building, which will include uh, specific activities uh, to be implemented, as well as to formulate the desired impact pathways. So that in a second step, uh, an M&E concept could be co-designed. And we heard already a lot of these approaches have also been followed. Um, in the different institutions. So we are quite optimistic that very soon we can put something uh, together here if we decide so, if we agree on that. So uh, the design of the general West African uh, TCIP, Theory of Change and Impact Pathway, initiates the co-development of the su suggested sorting house mechanism and it's implementing sorting house network. Who are those actors? We come later um, again to that. Uh, who will form the sorting house network with whom we will collaborate. So again, we are fortunately here already in this workshop, Farah, Korov and Waskal, but it, uh, uh, us, um, it, it, uh, we already worked uh, together in the future, so we are not starting from zero. In um, the next slide, um, I just want to uh, point that the theory of change, the next slide, please that the theory of change um, is a central reference point in a program and innovation management cycle. And this is the model that Lead for FNSSA is suggesting as the basis for the collaboration between the AU and the EU on FNSSA and here for the West Africa Alliance. And it's quite simple. It's just a four phases um, model. Uh, we have to prioritize common goals and common techniques to reach these goals. We uh, will have to invest into research and innovation activities. And at a certain uh, um, period of time, after a certain period of time, we will have some research output. And what do we do with this research output? And there, in particular, the sorting house mechanism will come in place. We will have to analyze research output. We have to formulate recommendations, but very much focus to the end users of science. And please remember this slide that I showed before. There's a, a big diversity of end users of science. So from this third phase in the PIMC, we initiate the dialogues between science and end users so that also the scientists will have a feedback uh, from the ground, from the end users about uh, research questions, perhaps, which they overlooked. So we are looking with the PIMC model in general for practical answers about how the coordination of different funders alliances and the dialogue processes to sorting and channeling knowledge could work. Um, in the next uh, slide, please, um, the co-development of the sorting house mechanism and a coordination infrastructure is an answer to that. And just briefly, we identified here four main fields of coordination, the funders networks, the sorting house network, the interfaces for knowledge management and communication as such needs a kind of co uh, coordination. And already, and, and also this already um, exists as we heard um, in, in the last uh, presentations before. So, a partnership platform could serve all these needs if we design it, if we co-design it in an appropriate way. The next slide, please. And then I'm coming to an end. Um, the question <laughs> is where to start. Uh, again, we have here Korov, Waskal, ECOWAS um, on board and many more actors who are already active in the region with specific mandates and practices with agendas already around knowledge management. And we hope that some are listening here and will join the follow up of this workshop. One suggestion is um, to uh, address knowledge hubs. And in the next slide, you see uh, that Leap for FNSSA already started working on a project uh, database. Please feel free uh, to contact our dear colleagues, Mrs. Petronella Chaminuka from the Agricultural Research Council in South Africa, as well as Mr. Yanis Dimitriou from the Swedish University of Agricultural Science, who is also here today. Both are also here today. Um, 
And the intention here is to find out which database managers are in West Africa and how can we uh, link uh, those together so that uh, we also have a, a proper uh, and a coordinated process with regards to the development of knowledge management systems. The second and last point is um, that we uh, suggest, as uh, I said already, to initiate right now a sorting house network while building already, in, uh, already on the existing networks and um, on the coordination mechanisms of experts in West Africa. So this sorting house network is meant to uh, be expanded and it will have to be coordinated in an appropriate way. And um, this sorting house network is furthermore meant to um, develop uh, the sorting house mechanism that we are envisaging. In the next slide, uh, you will see uh, with this uh, particular task here and our whole team uh, about <coughs> actors, alliances and policies, um, you can contact uh, Mrs. Jackie Cardo, uh, who is today's rapporteur here in panel one from the Network of African National Science Academies and me so that we can start building this sorting house network and co-design the sorting house mechanism. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite the next presenter. It's his Christian Benek from FARA. He has worked as a university lecturer, but uh, in his last uh, assignments. He has worked for SADC, for CTA, and he's now a lead specialist on capacity development and coordinator of TAT in FARA. Christian, please, your presentation. Great. Thank you, Henning. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure whether it is it's a good thing or a bad thing to come after all these excellent presentations because I've been scribbling lots of notes on my own uh, printout of my slides. Um, so the, the request here was to share some thoughts about how we could set up this West African network um, that we're talking about. And people have used the term alliance, others have used the term platforms. Uh, we saw uh, Stefan talk about the term, you know, sorting house and so on. And I think the, this workshop is really about trying to conceptualize what is it that we are working towards. So I'm just going to kind of try to bring some of the experiences from our past and help us you know, get through the process of reflection uh, for, towards the future. So I'll go to the next slide. And in the next three slides, actually, I'll be showing you three different perspectives. Now, here is how we have been told or for the last 20 years we've been told that this is how we we operate and I think Ernest did a very good job when he talked about the principles of subsidiarity he talked of solidarity and complementarity and we are all told that this is the way we could we structure ourselves to work together and in the context of the forum for agricultural research in Africa uh, which has all these members we we try to structure ourselves so that the ones who are coordinating or facilitating processes are, are closest to the action. And therefore, uh, the secretariat of, the, of, the, of FARA can liaise through the sub-regional organizations in the three or four sub-regions, which then liaise with the, the NARS or the, the, the NARIS, if you want, the innovation systems at each level. And that's, that's how we, we could sit, think of it as being structure but what is important is that there are purposeful structured conversations that happen both laterally at each level but also vertically within this this model so that that's yeah if i can go to the next slide in in the next slide we'll be looking at the how, what does it look like physically You've, you've heard the structure, that's, that's how we, we say we should be organized. But then uh, if we look at the map of Africa, and here again, we're looking at the, the membership of the Forum uh, for Agricultural Research in Africa. And you've already heard of the, the term sub-regional organization, of which one of the examples is the CORAF, uh, dealing with Western and uh, Central Africa. And 
these organizations have now been functioning uh, as members of the forum along the AU, uh, AU's CADEP Malabo mandate, you know, in terms of as a, as a loose consortium. And as was mentioned already by Bernard, um, the DESIRA program, for example, is supporting uh, several of these uh, CADEP XPLA4 organizations that Irene mentioned um, to, to better coordinate or strengthen the capacity for coordination and facilitation of agricultural research and innovation uh, across Africa. But when you look at the, 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 the comparison, here is uh, the map on the left is the map of Africa with the different sub-regional uh, distributions. I've just taken one example of a Pan-African program uh, intervention with which I'm involved now, uh, funded by the African Development Bank called the TAT, Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, that covers uh, on the map, it shows 27 countries, soon to be expanded to 30, with a, a variety of interventions across multiple uh, priority value chains uh, and interventions. But so we find that there is, um, while we are limited, while we are separated by our physical boundaries or national boundaries, our language uh, differences, our cultures, cultural differences, and our uh, ecosystems, um, we still differ, but sometimes not, not, uh, not uh, large enough that we don't share the same problems and can actually use the same solutions. And that's what, that is why we still need a platform that enables the, uh, exchanges across the different memberships, the, across countries in a sub-region, but also across the different um, sub-regions. Next slide, please. So we've, we've seen an, organization, uh, an organizational framework before, a physical uh, framework just now. And now we look at it uh, in terms of what does the forum look like if we expressed it in terms of the language of development? And you'll, hear, you'll see many of the terms that were mentioned by uh, the previous presenters here that uh, you know, we are focusing on achieving food and nutrition security. We are trying to create more jobs and income. We're improving resilience. We are still, we are looking at improving natural resource management. And while uh, Dr. Tenkwana was presenting the objectives of CORAF, I, I could feel that looking at this diagram, people say, yes, I can recognize uh, CORAF as being part of this forum and that the forum itself has common objectives amongst all the members. So when we look at the whole process, um, we can focus on the functions of the forum is to look at promoting advocacy, strengthening capacity, knowledge management or knowledge exchange, partnerships and coordination. So that's that was also another aspect that we need to we need to put together. And I think we can go to the next slide now. Uh, how do we now put it all together into this structure of this alliance? And unfortunately, trying to bring it together still means that we have to, sh to show some form of hierarchy. But, but this is um, something we've been, we've been um, considering since last year at Faro for a few, couple of years now, is that the, the, the best place is to, and I'll use the word, um, I think it was Mauricio who said, there's a fil rouge. What is the red thread that runs across? Is the, the approach of the principles of an agricultural innovation system, or if you want to call the agricultural research and innovation system, the principles are the same and they apply at different levels of organization. And here, this is just to show that the discussions we're having in terms of the EU Africa platform still has to fit within a global context, in a continental context, sub-regional and national context. Um, and this is the diagram that we've been using at FARA to, to illustrate the, the mode of operation of the forum. How do we facilitate conversations happening with the partners at the different levels? So there's a global level. And, and if you consider the circle there, it's the multi-stakeholder partnerships. And I've just listed a few. Perhaps uh, Bernard might, might be saying, oh, where's the representative of the funders network at each level of this table? The question should also be, where does the funder network sit 
uh, is there a specific level where it, where it interacts with the system or does it also get represented at different levels? Now, so far we've been talking amongst regional institutions, sub-regional institutions and at national level. And at the moment, uh, we are trying to look at how can we push this model of the agricultural innovation systems approach right down to the national and sub-national level. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the, at the national level, we are looking at innovation platforms, strategic establishment of strategic innovation platforms as the mechanism to coordinate an agricultural innovation system at national level. Um, and that, that is, a, a, a we talk of the NARS, some people talk of NARIS, uh, research and innovation systems, NARES, research and extension systems, but it, they're all systems that need to operate within an agricultural innovation uh, context. We're also looking at how, to what extent can we push this model of the agricultural innovation right down to the community level, where very often nowadays we talk of innovation platforms, establishing innovation platforms, even towards commercialization of agriculture. So the challenge now is, in what way does the innovation platform itself become a mechanism for coordination of agricultural innovation systems at local and community level? So perhaps this, this uh, uh, description might be more appealing to those who are the innovators who are listening to us and who will be presenting later today and tomorrow. But if you now go back up, we're looking at the mechanisms that were mentioned by Dr. Irene, the science agenda, uh, the frameworks and so on, relate to the way we link up the CADEP Malabo interventions, well, at least SDGs, CADEP Malabo interventions, right down to the actions happening on the ground. And on the right, I've just mentioned um, for the moment, uh, and I think Dr. Tenkwano mentioned this, uh, the strategy has been to look at how do we now talk about scaling in terms of uh, a technology delivery infrastructure? It's it's very interesting approach, but somehow it might be a bit of a top-down approach, but we need to recognize that the mechanism we're talking about also need to satisfy the need for coordination, knowledge management, engagement in different directions, monitoring and evaluation and learning as Stefan mentioned. So all in all, this is kind of the basis of what we need to be thinking about in terms of what does this alliance represent in the case of Western Africa? If you can go to the next slide, please. So while I did this, I tried to think of who are the people we should link up with. And obviously I did a, a, I did a worse job than Ernest in terms of mentioning, but I just thought this is, these are some of the representations that I could think of just going back through, you know, who, had, who came to my mind in the last week in terms of thinking about preparing for this presentation. And you will recognize a lot of the same networks that are represented here today in the presentations, some of the programs. Uh, we have the farmers representation extension, the CORAF technical networks are there. Although we see CORAF as an, as an institution or an organization, but it actually is there representing the technical networks. We have the youth represented we have names of some networks that existed that are no longer there. And, and that is the key that most of these, uh, these groupings or networks or communities of practice are centered around an, in, around an initiative. And very of, too often we've seen that when the initiative fades away, the, the, the network also tends to die down. So I think in our context, we are trying to um, look at a model, an alliance that is going to be sus well, sustainable, durable, uh, is going to be here for the long term. And yeah, you will recognize some of them. I even included the capacity for dev network. And I thought, okay, the, the European uh, Union, the, the commission members tend to interact a lot more on the capacity for dev um, platform. But uh, how many of us actually are also on the platform and interacting with them on that? So we got to also be on the lookout for where is it that the people we want to, inter to engage uh, uh, kind of coexist and, and, and interact. So if you look at the whole diagram, I would say the, the, the key elements in Western Africa would probably be 
you know, ECOWAS, CORAF, trying to work together to help constitute the, for, the, the, the core of some, some form of this alliance. And obviously then organizations like FARA and so on would be there to support uh, in terms of the, uh, the implementation. Next slide, please. I think I have three slides more. Um, and yeah, I know Henning asked me to, to make this intervention because I'm coming in from much, much more from a knowledge management perspective. And you can see my bias here is that I believe that a lot of the work we do in, in, in collaboration on the platform depends on the way we exchange knowledge, the conversations we have, the dialogue we have. And I try to analyze this into the conversations. Well, I came up with four things that we need to be focusing on in terms of the functionalities. We're looking at conversations, dialogue and knowledge exchange, both laterally and vertically. Now vertically, meaning that you might need to connect, uh, let's say, with someone closer to, to the ground in terms of outreach, in terms of scaling, in terms of contractual arrangements. But at the same time, you need to, to feel responsible to be able to carry the message upwards as well. How do you represent your stakeholders? How do you bring the synthesis of what they're facing up to the, to the different platforms? The second element is about seek, actively seeking and net, uh, networking and collaborative joint actions. And again, I've looked at some elements of what it means to do it laterally and vertically. And vertically in both directions, sort of upstream and downstream. Um, the co-organization of interventions and activities the kinds of things that, um, uh, yeah, in, in ECOWAS, uh, I think, yes, ECOWAS talked about 50 different interventions happening within, within the ECOWAP, ECOWAP 1 phase. And that's, that's the kind of uh, elements we need to look at. What is that joint sense of purpose? What are the principles of operation of these interventions? How do we jointly plan? And, and most of all, how often do we celebrate partnerships? You know, uh, we are all talking here in this workshop, but how are we celebrating the fact that we've actually been able to come together and discuss and hopefully come out with feeling energized and positive about the future? And the, the final element is also having a common shared purpose. Uh, I think Henning in his initial slide talked about the, com the common practice. And I, I think we need to have a common purpose, a common vision, and this is all about us uh, continuously trying to get good practices out there, learning from our experiences and getting it scaled out. So the, the, the key question here is, what do we want to achieve with this, the establishment or the constitution of this new platform in Western Africa? Do we want to do it quickly just for the sake of setting it up? Or do we want to set it up with the intention that this needs to be there for the long term? And that's why I said, do you want to go fast or do you want to go far? So I come to the next slide. And now I'm going to build on what Stefan has mentioned, this mechanism of the program and innovation management cycle. Already when Dr. Irene talked about the value adding of the science agenda, she mentioned four components and I could recognize these four components in the four segments uh, in, this, uh, in this cycle. Uh, I did not mention them, but it was about prioritization. It's about mobilizing resources. It's about, uh, it was about the value adding in terms of, I can't remember now what it is. I, I should have written it down. But the, the, the key message here is that um, I tried also to map my, my uh, the, the four listings of, of cluster of activities or functionalities uh, that we need to have for, for, a, for a successful platform or engaging platform. And I've tried to position them around, this, around the screen. So we see that the conversations and dialogue uh, applies both at the level of learning from my experiences to set priorities for the future, but also learning conversations that happen throughout the process where we are learning by doing, or we are learning while we are doing. In, for example, in the case of complex systems, we always say you cannot have time to 
devise a solution and then apply. You've got to keep on uh, improving while you're, while you're doing things. And then you see the other sections of the seeking the networking and collaborative actions sitting at the, at the, at the intersection of these uh, different quadrants. And maybe these are the, 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 the philosophies that we need to put into place to, to move from one segment to the other to, to, to contribute to the dialogue. Again, this is my knowledge management and knowledge exchange bias coming through here. So that is just food for thought for the discussions that will follow. And I'll just uh, come back to the last slide now. Uh, sorry, I'll move to the next slide, but I'm coming back to a concept I presented before, just to put it all together. It's the same structure. And I've mentioned, I've just illustrated the EU platform, the EU AU platform sitting somewhere between, you know, the global and the continental context. Um, but we are also here to talk about where would we position or how would we illustrate the role of this alliance in Western Africa? And, and I purposely did not put anything there because I want the audience to think about is it something that cuts across multiple hierarchies that are represented in this diagram or not? At the same time, something else we need to be addressing is that the, the le there are four levels of conversations that we need to address to make sense to each other. Um, and I'm looking at these four levels on the right. Those the conversations that, that happen around policy concepts and issues, we could say, let's put the policy policymakers or decision makers in that bracket, but we all are involved in policies. We need to understand it. And, but there are conversations that happen at the level of the policymakers that are, are, are not of interest to the ones who are down on the ground, focusing on how to deliver uh, the outputs of a project, how to achieve commercialization, how to engage with business, which are related to the achieving the impacts on livelihood. So I'm just, I'm just putting it out there as the four levels of conversations. And through this presentation today, I heard Rose and uh, Marta might be interested in the second level, talking about technology, technical environments, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. This is, these are still policy, well, elements that are related to policy, but are more related to policy within the science and technology uh, sphere. So there might be conversations that happen with people, around people around that level that also need to be now communicated, converted into, tra translated into a policy concept, but also make sense for, the, for those who are implementing projects uh, at, a, at, a, at the next level down. Um, I think Leap, Leap, Leap Agri, as uh, Bear now mentioned, is also around the technology and technical environment. And one comment I'd like to make is that we, in our presentation so far, we've focused very much on the EU-AU interactions, but how does this platform also bring on board the interactions we're having with other donors or funders from outside uh, the sphere of EU-AU interactions? So I'll, I'll leave you with this slide as the, as the final um, image that, that sticks in your mind to just to illustrate that we are, we are dealing with a system that is not so straightforward. As Stefan said, there's a lot of interactions and iterations that have to happen for the success of the Alliance and for it to, for it to continue in the long term. I think the key is to have the dialogue may, continuing whether there's any funding or not around it, but we are all stimulating each other intellectually to be able to innovate and keep on innovating within our own context. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Christian, thank you very much for these very interesting questions you put on the table and the ideas. Now, as a last presenter, I would like to ask Dr. Mumini Sabadogo, the executive director of WASCAL, to give his presentation. And after that presentation, we will already have enough input for a small discussion 
for which I would like Gaetano to give us maybe 20 minutes. And then this will end our very interesting panel. So Dr. Mumini Savadogo, thank you very much for being with us. Please, your presentation. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to uh, uh, take the floor and uh, share uh, some of our our thought uh, on the on this important and very relevant topic. Uh, I would like to appreciate also all those uh, uh, participating in this panel. Of course, our, our colleagues, our friends, uh, all on this panel, so that together we can uh, at least. Um, a streamline our thinking on how we can build better uh, and then organize ourselves better uh, to serve better uh, all our countries. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, let's go straight to the presentation. And I would like, if you can move to the second slide, please. Yeah, so here I would like to um, touch on three main aspects. I've been asked to talk with you about perspective of Waskar and some recommendation uh, about uh, uh, this uh, uh, partnership. And I would like to touch on three main aspects, the relevance of this ambitious partnership, uh, Waskar as international network uh, that's responding to uh, climate change challenges in West Africa. And of course, I will draw some recommendation that we may need or may, we may want to take on board in our discussions. Next. Yeah, here I think what uh, uh, all of us are striving for is really jointly to make sure that we achieve our common target. If you look around and consider uh, the statistics we are having and we add them this morning again, reminding us that altogether we are maybe doing well, but not enough. And the key message for me here is that really we need to better coordinate and synergize our effort so that we can deliver better and then we can work better on resilient and sustainable agri-food systems. Next. Yeah, so I would like here to uh, talk a bit about um, how at Waskal we uh, organize uh, to, uh, as an example of international uh, networking uh, platform. Uh, Waskal is uh, an international organization with focus on West Africa. And uh, what we do is that we mobilize international, regional and national uh, expertise, competencies, uh, so that uh, we can respond uh, to uh, the challenges, our common challenges, uh, with tailored climate and environmental services for smart policies and actions. And this needs, of course, uh, 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 in an approach, a partnerial approach with um, a strong partnership you need to build at all levels. So we operate three, uh, three major streams. Um, through consultations at national, regional levels, we come to the realization that there are two main aspects that we may need to complement in the region to make more effective uh, our responses to the challenge of climate change. For example, as a cross-cutting issue on the food, nutrition, and sustainable agriculture uh, aspects. So the first one is uh, on capacity building. Uh, and on capacity building, we're looking at how we can prepare young scientists that uh, can continue uh, demultiplicating uh, knowledge, uh, but also uh, policy makers, experts, and practitioners, how they can be really built up so that they can understand, they can operate, and they can bring necessary support 
to the countries, to the region, and at the international level too. So they organized with 12 graduate schools uh, in partnership with our uh, German institutions. More than 20 institutions have been mobilized uh, to partner with us with uh, at national level 12 uh, universities uh, so that we pull together our expertise and competencies uh, to train international at an international standard uh, expert that they can contribute effectively. And then we do also some experts training and facility, build facilities that can at all raise the scientific capacities of the region to, uh, uh, for, uh, to tackle uh, this issue. Then we have the second stream is research and innovation. Uh, there too, through the consultations at national and regional levels, we built a research program which focus mainly on five uh, five teams, and they are so important, the land use aspect, uh, the risk management aspect, and then, of course, the migrations due to climate change aspect, that's all the socioeconomy, and then the smart agriculture and renewable energy as a very key, important, uh, that can uh, really uh, rise and help improve very fast uh, our food nutrition and system agriculture systems. So, and then the third one is on data. Come to a resolution that we need to have a strong data uh, infrastructure that we have built and then equipped enough to be able to support technology development, to support integrated modeling system, to support observation networks so that we can collect also data, analyze and share. And these streams, three streams are to working together and at all levels. And this, uh, we see it as a model of functional, functional networking systems that can also help and uh, complementing the other institutions that are on board here in this discussion. Next, please. Next slide, yes. And you see that to do that, to be able to do that, you need to uh, collaborate very actively with so many stakeholders around, uh, starting at national level, where we do, you, you have to align with the policies, consult, co-develop some of the ideas through feasibility studies, the studies through uh, piloting some of the uh, uh, technologies which involve private sector and farmers, and then together you uh, co-develop it and to be able uh, to then streamline some of the services that are needed at national level. Then at the regional level, you have to do the same, at the international, do the same. But in all, all the most important is to have a functional network working system that can go from top uh, from down to top and then top to down that's so that you can work together and identifying the key challenges together and then pulling your effort scientist competence and also uh, technological capacities together so that you can better serve and improve at all the uh, capacity of the region to respond effectively to the challenges put before us next Next, please. So, so what we are uh, based on all the observations and uh, all the different uh, also uh, intervention I've had, I have in view that we need really to put together our effort in a functional manner, so that we can at least uh, support smart policies and actions uh, and back uh, with science and innovation. This is our role, our task together, if we give hands, I'm sure we can deliver that through mobilizing international and regional and national efforts together. And then for me, I see it, if we want it to be effective, we need an inclusive and reliable platforms. The previous speaker mentioned that one very well, because we need to build something that is effective reliable and sustainable so that we can really uh, serve, uh, it can serve as a reference for policymakers and also for other end users so that they can together through the regional uh, bodies, uh, political bodies, they can really be effective and sustainable. That's what we need and really uh, contribute to uh, uh, implement the policies, but also contribute to fit the policies 
uh, in West Africa. So I would recommend that really we together um, uh, continue what we have started in dialoguing so that we find appropriate working scheme what working team, team we need to put in place to be effective. And we can look also some of the uh, important areas like having relevant capacities. We know that that's the area we need in knowledge generation, knowledge management, brokering, accessibility, infrastructure that is needed to put together so that we can reach our target. And then, of course, reliable technologies and services provision. This is very important. Uh, just listening uh, to end users have the need in terms of services, what kind of scientific services, technological services they are expecting from us together as a scientific community and as innovators so that we can bring it to them. That's really will fit to the need. And then, of course, lastly, we need to build on existing platforms. And I think they have been very well emphasized. And then strengthen our coordination yeah, around the science policy interactions at all levels. I mean, national, regional levels with, of course, support of international. And this AU, uh, African Union uh, 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 partnership is, for me, a good opportunity. And we just need to streamline our working scheme together so that we can deliver and contribute more to accelerate our uh, the achievement of our target uh, global and common target for zero anger in 2030. So thank you so much. I think that's what I wanted to share with you. I thank you for the opportunity and uh, avail myself for any uh, further discussions and uh, the follow-up uh, dialogues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think you really made it well. You were the last presenter in this row and you already put all the questions we can tackle in our small discussion, which will follow on the table. So um, we're a bit over time, but we will still use some time to discuss. I also invite, uh, the, the panel members from before to, to, to join now. Um, maybe Mumini Savadago, because you just made this uh, good summary. What do you think are the steps we would have to take now to set up such a West African chapter, such a West Africa FNSSA alliance, building on existing uh, activities to, to make it a chapter for the EU-AU partnership. Yes, thank you very much. I think the, the, the first step for us is to look at uh, the, you know, the existing platforms and look at what are the, the missing links, you know, what are the missing links, okay? for us to synergize better. What could be the missing links? Once together we identify those missing list, uh, links, then we can together then uh, build on okay, our common target. We need to find our common targets. Once this is defined beyond, uh, I mean, the teams, global teams that have been identified for this partnership, we need to go beyond that and fix a clear, a clear target. And uh, I believe that the experience of uh, Leap Agri on build, in build, in building impact pathways will help us go there. So that, and then along that, we can, of course, uh, based on the, uh, you know, identifying the missing link, we can together uh, join the efforts. That's how I see it. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I could ask Ernest Ubi on the basis of his experience of building such platforms, uh, what, what, what do you think? What are the next steps we should take? What is your recommendation? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, for the next steps, I think it would be good to do a quick assessment of all the critical actors in, in the region who can belong to such a platform. Uh, to identify their areas 
of strength uh, that they can come into the platform. That is, that is one important point. Another very important point is that um, with such platforms, uh, you want it to be as inclusive and comprehensive as possible so that you, nobody, no critical actor or important uh, stakeholder is left out. So it will be very good to um, try to get as many people or, or many institutions as possible onto the platform. But in doing so, again, um, you must define the, the roles and the responsibilities of a platform because this is not going to be the first platform in West Africa. There are already many existing uh, interprofessional um, platforms that are in West Africa. So it must be very clear from the start that the terms of reference must be defined. If my institution belongs to this platform, what can I contribute in terms of knowledge, in terms of technical outputs, etc. Also, uh, if my institution is part of this platform, what can I get in terms of uh, knowledge sharing, knowledge management, in terms of accessing best practices of, uh, for agricultural transformation uh, for my organization? So there must be a clear cut uh, terms of reference because if not, there might be duplication. You have various platforms on, uh, for farmers organization, you have commodity platforms, you have some policy think tanks, etc. They are all good. Uh, they all add to the uh, agricultural uh, development process in West Africa. But for this one that we're proposing, which I think is a good one, I would support, uh, needs to have clear cut uh, terms of reference so that we don't duplicate we don't uh, reinvent the wheel, what others have done, we want to try to do. We should see how, uh, as one speaker said, create that complementarity, that synergy that can help in uh, strengthening the platform between Europe and the African Union and the RECs and even the member states. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this positive and also Good recommendations. Um, maybe I can can go on to Dr. Abdul Tenkwa. No, you are the director of the West African Forum, and we had just the recommendations to build on the existing initiatives to look where do we have gaps where we can uh, where are the missing links. Uh, but we were also asked. Uh, because this is not the first platform to define roles. Can, can you give us some recommendations or some ideas how we could go forward here? Um, thank you very much. Having heard what all that have said before me, there is really little that I would like to add. It's really important that looking at the complexity of the ecosystem, that will know who is doing what and where. So that stakeholder mapping needs to be done very uh, clearly at different levels. We, we tend to focus so much on, on the doing part, borrowing from um, uh, Krishna's uh, presentation. We focus so much on the doing part, who is doing what, but who is funding what is also equally important because there is a need to coordinate also from the side of the donor agencies as uh, that determines to what extent we have a certain level of freedom to operate and partner. It's extremely important that we have also a funders network uh, arrangement being discussed. I would like also to suggest that we need to think about the engagement protocol. How do we organize ourselves as we set up uh, the platform, the alliance? Is it going to be informal? Are we going to just be friends talking nicely to each other or should we hold each other accountable? Uh, and if so, how do we do it? Will we work as shareholders? 
I think all these are important elements that we need to be thinking about. And finally, um, as I said, I don't have much to add. We may need to think a little beyond the relationship um, between Africa and, and Europe at this stage. Uh, we have so many other players on the continent and even in the region here that are coming from outside uh, these uh, two uh, continents and that uh, their, their efforts, I mean, their, their presence dictates so much about how we can do together. So this is something that we may need to to keep at least in the background as we think of how we, we, we develop our relationship. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I can be more specific than that, but I hope that what you heard is useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, could I ask maybe Irene Anor from Pong? from far uh, to, to share her, her views about this and also share her ideas about next steps. Mm. Can you hear Irene? I cannot hear her at the moment. I um, mean, your microphone is off. Perhaps you could switch uh, on your microphone. Maybe then I, I, I quickly, let's say, switch to Krishan Benik. And when, once Irene is back, we'll ask her, Krishan, please, as you're also from Farah. Yeah, I think, well, I will not talk on behalf of, uh, of uh, Irene. I think it's good that she can come in. Um, I've, I've, I think some of the some of the important um, elements. One of them I picked up is also the I talk about the cultural differences. I think in West Africa, and I think Ernest mentioned this this term interprofession in French, which is a term and it's a contextual process of of a community of practice that does not exist in other parts of Africa or maybe in the non-Francophone world. Uh, in a way, the, the Francophone world is sometimes more structured in the way they do things than other non-French speaking uh, areas. So one of them is the Ete profession, which is something that now perhaps we could be looking more at the bridge between science and agribusiness. We also have this, uh, the concept of the chambers of agriculture uh, that, again, that from a previous work I did, do you realize that uh, the kind of the Commonwealth countries or the English speaking world in Africa does not have the same approach for registration of agribusinesses or businesses dealing with Africa as they do in, um, in the Francophone or the French speaking Africa? whereby any business has to be registered with the Chamber of Agriculture. And that's a nice way of getting to know who is doing what and who's involved. So, okay, I'm not talking about my, I'm just reflecting beyond my presentation and the elements that we need to connect to, but I would definitely support the fact that we need to be spending more time discussing in terms of the protocol that uh, Dr. Tekwondo mentioned. How do we go about it? Are we going to be well, we should always be friends, but how do we now take the friendship to different levels in terms of partnerships and whether we should define different levels of partnerships that can evolve with time? And I think that's all what we want to do. Perhaps we cannot define from, from right from the start what we will all do and define our work packages, but at least we know that we're moving in the same direction. And that would be my, my preference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, addressing done? this culture. I think Irene is here. Please, Irene, we would like to to, to 
global West African chapter for the AU EU partnership? Yes. Okay. I'm. I think a lot has been said already. Um. So the, the two points. Um. One is still about the mapping. It's it's quite important that we know who is doing what, but we have to know who is doing what within certain priority areas. What we are starting to do and think about in relation to the science agenda is that if we have seven priority themes, we actually don't know who is doing what, who is funding what, not just within the Africa uh, EU AU, but even outside the EU AU, who is actually funding what. This is important because, you know, in Africa, a lot of decisions are made based on funding. And in fact, some of the priorities that we support are influenced by the funding. So it's important that when we do the mapping that many people are mentioning, we do it based on the priorities and we also do it outside um, just EU, AU. So we have a global picture um, of what is going on before we then figure out you know, where the partnerships are relevant. For example, under the DESIRA funded um, program, the CADAPEX V4, we've started mapping uh, all CSA initiatives, but the in, that is also mapping other aspects of these initiatives. And we have a nice frame that probably we could share to see how do we do that in in other priority areas um, outside the issue of CSA or resilience. Um, the other thing is the linking of what we are doing already to new areas. Um, we know that research and innovation in Africa and probably elsewhere is moving towards um, agroecological um, aspects. But that depends also on the so-called socioeconomic intensification. So that's another area. Socioeconomic intensification basically is looking at all the facets that is linked to livelihoods, sustainable livelihoods. So as we do the mapping, we also want to know what are the dynamics in terms of establishing sustainable livelihoods. And that's why inclusivity is important. Uh, in terms of social capital and other types of capital that will ensure that our end user, and I like very much what Stefan presented on, on that end user frame, our end user is directly contributing to um, the, the, the dynamics and is contributing to the innovation that's going on. And so the issue of co-creation and co-innovation becomes important. So moving forward, I think the mapping is a good idea, but we need to streamline. We can't do mapping, mapping, you know, we have to streamline what we are mapping within which priorities we are mapping and how do we include the other dynamics outside the EU, AU. That definitely influences, at least from the Africa perspective, influences what the governments and even some of the decision makers put their uh, emphasis on. So I think those those are the big points. Then on the engagement protocols that Dr. Tenkwan mentioned, I think that is very important. In this conversation, we have highlighted the issue of coordination of research and innovation. But we are doing that in the context of developments around the one CGIAR. You know, that in itself brings uh, new dynamics and we need to take that on board and see how do we have that conversation so that when we have alliances or partnerships, these will stand the test of time because we are looking at long-term partnerships or long-term research and innovation um, groups that will be able to help Africa uh, come out of its vulnerability. And for instance, for, for us to work with Europe Europe also needs to be interested. And as I think um, Philippe mentioned, 
the idea of Live for FNSSC is to ensure that both Africa and Europe are working in a symbiotic way. So it's not like an aid issue. So I, I think we have said these things and we are, we are repeating ourselves, but I think we should streamline uh, whatever we do in terms of the mapping. We should be inclusive and we should look a little bit at the socioeconomic uh, inter intensification uh, dynamics when it comes to resilience um, in, in the scheme of things. Thank you. Um, thank you, Irene. Um, that's a very good point. Um, I can see a hand from Stefan. Uh, and then uh, after him, we will have to pass to Jackie to wrap up. And Henning will join in a few minutes. Uh, his uh, line is disconnected. Please, Stefan. Yes, thank you very much. And again, uh, thank you very much for this very enriching uh, discussion that we have here. Uh, I have three uh, suggestions, and it is mainly uh, we can use the Leave for Evidence A project to go several steps forward. And just in a brief response to your very valuable um, contributions, in, again, it's very enriching for me. Uh, if it comes to the mapping, um, I, I have a problem with mapping. On the one hand, of course, I would like to know what is going on. On the other hand, um, uh, is a mapping always up to date? Is it not time for um, practicing mapping more in a modern way so that it is a continuous process of networking and not a, a, a singular event of mapping who is currently, who are the important institutions? The three uh, suggestions that I want to make uh, to make use of uh, the Leap for FNSSA project, because um, there are resources uh, to form uh, the partnership platform, there are resources to form uh, the West African Alliance. Uh, they are limited, but we can do something with these uh, limited resources. The first idea is um, I want to suggest, and I hope, Jackie, that you agree, because we both are uh, coordinating this group in Leap for FNSSA, which is addressing the sorting house mechanism. I suggest that we um, have very soon a meeting of uh, all database manager and knowledge manager in the West African region. And um, if you agree and allow, uh, we simply would like uh, to address uh, in particular an uh, um, ECOWAS, CORAF, um, FARA, uh, and, and WASCAL, and others who might want to join um, to discuss um, where are synergies between um, data managers and knowledge managers and um, how can we uh, collaborate in a, in a, in a closer uh, way together. Uh, this would be, uh, and I will have to discuss this with our uh, colleagues, which I mentioned already, who are running uh, the uh, FNSSA project database, um, because uh, this is one element of the broader idea of a knowledge management and communication framework um, to uh, allow access to those informations that are stored there and the information that uh, the other organizations are already collecting. So let's have a meeting very soon um, uh, on that issue. And perhaps there are some ideas also from the participants here around uh, who might uh, join uh, a process like that. We can organize a virtual meeting. Uh, the second point is, um, Again, with regard to the sorting house uh, mechanism, um, I suggest uh, that uh, we start a theory of change and impact pathway for the West African uh, Alliance very soon. Again, with uh, already before mentioned organizations and some other partners who might want to join us or who are suggested uh, by the partners here to uh, initiate a situation analysis. And again, we heard today, we are all doing situation analysis. We are assessing situations we are in. Let's bring this together towards the West Africa Alliance. We also here uh, can offer a virtual meeting as a first step into a process like that. Um, the, uh, sec the, the third suggestion is, which is already a part of our plan, with regard to developing the sorting house mechanism and establishing the sorting house network, 
um, that uh, we will have a virtual meeting about mechanisms uh, for the communication between science and end users. Um, I suggest instead of, uh, but, but this does not mean that I'm against mapping, we can initiate now a mapping. Um, instead of waiting for having the, the whole picture available, let's simply start doing something because this network is already about to grow. We are here together and it is up to us whether we want to maintain it and to make it um, a sustainable and a long-term process uh, to collaborate together. So I'm suggesting three virtual meetings, one for data and knowledge managers, one uh, to uh, uh, have a first draft, to develop a first draft of a situation analysis for the West African alliances and uh, the third virtual uh, workshop about mechanisms for the communication between science and end users. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Stefan. Time is running. We have to keep uh, it short. So I would like to invite Jackie to wrap up, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I think when you have such a long session with so many brilliant speakers, it's actually very difficult to summarize what uh, they say. But I think I'll focus more on the last section of our, of our discussion. And I think just at the top of my head, I was, I was just listening to um, Waskar, um, Dr. Sewadogo, talk about smart policies and actions backed by science and innovation. And that, that is critical. But in my mind, I, I was trying to figure out, is it smart in terms of brilliant or smart in the way we make smart objectives, specific, uh, talking about achievable, uh, realistic and time bound, things like that. So it's just to define that. So maybe, so I don't go just for one minute to explain the smart policies and actions. Okay, I guess he's not there. But anyway, uh, in that, oh, you're there. Okay, did you hear my question? Yes, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it's important to look at the smartness in two directions. Mm -hmm. The smart what first is to respond effectively, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. to the end user's need into our common goal target. That's mm -hmm. one aspect of the smartness. And mm -hmm. to do that, we need to follow appropriate processes. That's where we need also to be very smart on how we use our common or joint resources in terms of capacities, in terms of also a funding, et cetera, to get as quick as possible something mm -hmm. that is tangible and impactful. That's, okay. yeah. Thank you, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think just as the rapporteur, just to sum up, I think I would just look at what was the cross cutting threads in all the presentation we had today. I think we had buzzwords like inclusivity. And, and that is critical because if you're talking about policy and science intervention, but you also have the farmer communities or the national level uh, actors that would really benefit from such an alliance. So that inclusivity, I think is something that came across in all the presentation we had uh, earlier today. The issue of having platforms that are reliable. And I think Stefan also emphasized when we're looking at either data or knowledge management, it is critical that they're not just sound, but they're accurate. And that reliability, so whatever platform we end up with has to be based on a reliable platform. But the third thing that was also cross-cutting was the issue of uh, relevance. And I think uh, Krishna, Krishan brought this out when he specifically uh, spoke about a West African culture uh, that needs to be taken into account, the differences uh, in terms of how uh, relationships are built, uh, focusing more on making sure that those relationships are not just structured, but uh, acknowledged in a formal way for them to work and uh, where it is possible to bridge both science and agriculture in a manner where people can take responsibility for their contribution to that alliance or the, or, or 
the contribution that they're bringing on board. Uh, so those three things stood out for me in all, the issue of um, inclusivity, the issue of reliability in terms of the platforms being uh, 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 adopted, uh, and then the issue of um, relevance. And, and then lastly, and I think uh, focusing on the last bit of our uh, discussion was, uh, I think, a call to be able to utilize the existing um, existing platforms. And, and I think even when we were talking about creating an alliance that is not being built from scratch, we're looking at an intervention that will build on already uh, existing structures, existing organizations, existing knowledge hubs that have been created over time. And that for me is, is good. And, and something I think Irene uh, mentioned at the end is to realistic, realistically map out, do a stakeholder mapping that takes into account not just who's doing what and who's funding what, but to focus more on the priorities and, and look at the dynamics that go beyond just the EU, AU, uh, uh, dyna the dynamics of AU, EU relationships, so that it is more sustainable, forward looking, and actually applicable uh, contextually to the, uh, to the relationship. And, and in conclusion, I think um, the issue of how to engage, engage the protocols, uh, what, what would be the format of, of the West African Alliance once it is uh, 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 constituted? Uh, what would be the binding roles that we will subscribe to? How will we contribute to the theory of change that we need? And I think most of the presenters touched on what change they are looking to uh, uh, contribute to in the uh, organizations that are working on. So how, those, how they would contribute to that change, the theory of change, as well as the impact uh, uh, that comes therefrom, but then also in how we will manage the knowledge system that the West African Alliance will, will bring about. Um, I think I want to stop there and not go, I mean, we really had a long uh, discussion and specifics of each presentation. And because I know Katarina uh, also mentioned that there'll be a report after this, most of the detailed summaries of what uh, uh, picked out uh, from the presentations we had earlier will also be represented in writing. So I think I want to stop there, Katarina, and just save us some time. Thank you. <laughs> So thanks a lot. Oh, and this is a really great panel because it works without the moderator. I was just thrown out by the internet. Uh, I'm back to close this wonderful panel. And as I heard, uh, we will be back together in a future discussion, I hope. We would warmly like to invite you to a follow up of this discussion. And I do hope that uh, all of you had enough chance for the moment to contribute the ideas, but you have many more ideas and we will come back to you. Thanks a lot. I would like to hand over to the next panel. Goodbye. Thank you, Henning, and thank you all participants from panel one. Uh, we are moving to panel one, or uh, to panel two, and the moderator of panel two is Dora. She's my colleague from uh, Egypt, from the uh, Knowledge Economy Foundation, and she is um, co-leading uh, the work package on food, nutrition, security, and sustainable agriculture system improvement. Um, I hope she's connected with us and can take over to moderate panel two on innovation and digitalization and agriculture. Welcome, Dora. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you, everybody. I, it was really quite an amazing session we had this morning. I just hope that you still have enough stamina uh, to continue with us. Uh, we have a very large group of uh, 
of youth of different, different levels, uh, startups, idea uh, innovators. And uh, without further ado, I would like to invite you just two small notes of organization. One is that you use your chat for, the, uh, for putting your questions and that the questions will be handled at the question and the answer session. And uh, because I know we are late, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I maybe for the rest of the participants would like to confirm that we have invited each of the panelists to present not only, of course, their project and their pitch, but as well to uh, present their approach to how do they see their activities as startups, as uh, young SMEs, uh, better integrated, more meaningful into the uh, national programs uh, of their country as well at, at the regional level. But we will take this up when time is due now. I believe we can call on the first speaker and that is Louise Washira, yes. Oops. There she is. Wow. Welcome Louise. So, oh, we don't hear you. Up. Is there a problem with the voice? No, Dora, this is the presentation video that we received from her. Oh, okay, okay. We don't hear anything. We don't hear anything, people. We run a communications company called Atmos Precision Limited. We primarily focus on providing communications support to institutions in the agriculture sector and other sectors. Now, 2020 has happened and it has sent very many people back to the drawing board. We are no exception. We have to figure out how to remain relevant in a time of adversity. We all know the power of information and how YouTube has become modern day television. Now, back in March, we decided, you know what? We need to go out there and profile farmer stories, have them share what they're doing. So we've been collecting these stories and putting them up on our YouTube channel called Atmos Precision. Remember to subscribe with the hope that people will learn from these experiences. Now, from that experience, another opportunity presented itself because we were getting very many inquiries on how to go about, if it's about rearing livestock, how do I go about A to B and Z or a certain topic? So what we're currently doing is that we're partnering with stakeholders, input suppliers, uh, the non uh, development organizations on how to package stories which will help farmers learn about the A to Z of a certain topic. For instance, if it's dairy farming, the A to Z, where do you start? Do I start or do I not? And uh, in terms of value addition, do I add or how, how do I go about it? If it's about growing tomatoes, how do I go about it? So that's what we are currently working on. I'm looking forward to networking through this session and hopefully create synergies and also probably also uh, get support on how we can be able to scale up and also ideas on how we can be able to scale up. Looking forward to interacting with you. Great. Do we have her PowerPoint now? Yeah. Give me. Louise, do you hear us? Louise? Mm. 
she's connected but she cannot uh, she's not speaking louise can you put your mic on I'm sending you a message. Oh, that's, I'm sorry, that's the. Yes, I can activate the microphone, but she's not uh, in front of the PC, so... Oh, oh. Well, in any case, Louise is a very good example of... Uh, and she, she's not from West Africa, she's from Kenya, but she is really very good. Uh, and a very good example of uh, startups in... I would say she has a foot in agri-tech as well as a foot in food tech. And that she's really addressing the issue of, of establishing the linkages, which are, of course, the difficult part between businesses and farmers and research. Uh, she's having network challenges. Uh, what do you suggest we do, CM team? Shall we wait a little bit or? Shall we, shall we, go, shall we go on with another uh, idea carrier? I was yes. going to suggest that. Yes. Just yes. move ahead with Olozegun Adegun, mister. Give me the time to, to share okay. the video. Okay. Crop yield is declining. To protect their yield, farmers walk through several acres of farmland looking for crops that are stressed or diseased. This is a difficult challenge faced by over 38 million farmers in Nigeria. When such fault is identified, the farmer either asks the more experienced colleague for advice on what to do, or preferably wait for the extension agent to show up at the village. Today, extension service is either inadequate or non-existent. As a result, millions of farmers are not able to access the best advice and advanced farming practices leading to their inability to sustainably increase their yield and protect against pests and weed attacks. This has led to a steady decline in yield which is tied to farmers' prosperity as well as making farming less attractive to young people and women. Solving this problem presents a huge opportunity for impact and business. So we looked to space for Clue and discovered an e-extension tool called Capture. Capture is a software bot that uses satellite data and remote sensing to provide personalized crop health advice to local farmers via SMS, voice call, or in person. Benefits include knowing the status of crop health using basic growth indicators such as chlorophyll content, water stress, and weather, early detection of pest attacks with recommendation on what to do, evaluation of soil nutrient availability using a combination of current status of crop health and a long-term analysis of historical satellite data, followed by fertilizer recommendation. Extension advisors and farmers love it. So far, our software powers four farm organizations to support over 5,000 farmers generating $15,000 in revenue in the last 10 months. Our customers include Sasakawa SG2000 and 
Nigerian Agricultural Extension and Research Liaison Service, established in 1992 and 1963 respectively. Our business model is simple. We charge $5 per month per hectare or $50 per year per hectare. For new customers who want to do trials, we have a discount in place. We are looking to raise pre-seed funding from an angel investor as well as collaborators and partners to unlock the first million farmers. Our solution powers farmers and farmer organizations to produce more food with lesser resources using the power of satellite remote sensing. Imagine a new Africa with innovative tech-driven farmers. Imagine Rural Farmers Hub delivering crop insights from space. Thank you. That was quite interesting. And I, I suppose that you also provide probably uh, versions in different languages or it, this is part of the plan. Well, do you have a PowerPoint ready to go? Or should mm -hmm. we? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, maybe a quick presentation up until it's loaded. Mr. Olesogun Adegun is from Nigeria and he has developed a, a startup called the Rural Farmers Hub. And now we are going to listen to his suggestion as to better coordination, more integration within the national research and innovation programs of his country or his region. Mr. Adegun, I think you can. Okay. Uh, you Hi. Can, go. can you hear me now? Yes, we do hear you. Okay. Uh, good day, everyone. My name is actually uh, Gabriel. Olusegun is not able to join this call. I see. So I'll be presenting today. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm a co founder and uh, head of operations at Raw Farmers Hub. Next slide, please. So um, for this topic, uh, we'll be discussing, uh, I'll be discussing innovation and digitalization in agriculture, uh, paving the way for entrepreneurs, agri-tech and uh, food tech startups. Next slide, please. So in the last uh, two years plus, uh, we've identified the following as uh, limiting factors that will be preventing or rather inhibiting innovation uh, in this space. And the first one really is the lack of or inadequate fine grain data analysis. Uh, so the reason for the analysis is because sometimes you will find data, uh, fine grain data, but there is no way to know if that data is, is authentic and relied upon is the ground truth. Uh, and we've also observed that there are lots of organizations and projects and programs that collect different kinds of data from different farmers in different geographies. And all these data are kind of domicile uh, with them. And we find ourselves uh, uh, bringing up new programs that are designed to go and capture data that probably already exists. So that's a, a very big challenge that uh, we observe uh, that is preventing innovation from thriving. The second one is uh, most of the farmers that we have interacted with, uh, which at the moment is close to 10,000, they don't have data-driven insight. Most of them still rely on uh, a KEIC method of farming. They, they, the third one is organization. Um, I mean, this may be kind of personal because we, we kind of realize that um, most farmers are always on the losing end of, of bargaining in the marketplace. And the reason for this is because uh, they are not organized you know, in a way where they can say, this is how much we want to receive for the produce that we want to sell eventually. And uh, this hasn't been the case. There are a couple of, of, of farm cooperatives, but uh, uh, the, the, the organization is still very, very fragile. Uh, the fourth one is market information system. Um, there is no central means of knowing what the price of a commodity is or will be uh, for a particular farming season. Most farmers rely on uh, the middlemen who come to the marketplace to do bargaining and all that. And a lot of them are shortchanged in the process. 
And then the last one is the gender and religious bias. So sometimes in some parts of Nigeria, it's impossible to deliver innovation to certain gender women. And the reason for this is because of some, some religious or cultural biases. And we are confident that the kind of solution we are providing, which is remote uh, extension delivery, will be able to bypass some of these uh, cultural and religious biases and deliver insight directly to women and people who are disadvantaged. Next slide, please. So um, among all these things, we think that uh, uh, the most pressing thematic priorities uh, will be whatever innovation you want to bring to the market, you must, uh, the, the innovator needs to demonstrate this in, in a demo plot. So startups and other uh, innovators who want to come into this space must have plans to uh, carry out demonstration plots in different villages where they want the service to be used. Most farmers believe that when they see it first before they can be able to pay for it. Uh, they don't believe in flyers that much. But the second one is also like the fine grain data. Um, I think I'll touch on this in the next slide um, where I think uh, most of the players, both at the startup level and the policy level and the strategy level, we need to kind of have like a, an open sourced um, data repository where different players can contribute data and innovators and even strategy and policymakers can also take data in order to make some really good decision. The last one is lack of a secure market. Essentially, most farmers are not sure if they are going to sell uh, their harvest. We recently had a case where a farmer lost uh, several acres, acres of his farmland because he's waiting for the right market before he harvests. And then last one is the agro dealers who support these farmers needs to be networked in a way that is continuous and not just like a one-time activity. Uh, next slide, please. So the key actors we've identified that will make this thing thrive are the ad grower scheme, which happen to be the most organized uh, form of, uh, of, of crop production in the country at the moment, where you could have like uh, levels of leadership, you have actual implementation of best farming practices and et cetera. The second one is farm cooperatives, which are still very uh, fragile. The, the Third one is extension service. It is very vital. And the last one are the agripreneurs. And I put them at the bottom because the agripreneurs will rely on all these three. Mm. Next slide, please. So all these things I've mentioned, uh, I think can be, uh, can be summarized into two things. We think that it's imperative that we have a decentralized, uh, or will I say, a centralized data sharing uh, platform that is decentralized. So um, we have an extensive discussion around this, both internally and with some of our partners. And we are promoting uh, that uh, this discussion, this LEAP discussion should lead to some form of a, a data platform. You know, that is kind of decentralized by design that encourages sharing, especially sharing from the farmer point of view Part of the things we suggested in our document is that farmers should be able to be paid for the data they will give to this platform. Or if not cash payments, they should be able to convert some of the data they share to this platform into some form of incentives that can be uh, uh, registered with a vendor, let's say a farm impute or, or microcredit, et cetera. And then the last one will also be the, this, the design of this platform should be interoperable so that different parties can actually plug into it and get the kind of data they need uh, to execute their business plan. Um, I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Sugun. I just would like to, sorry, Gabriel. <laughs> Gabriel. I just would like to add that uh, I am the founder and chairman of a non-for-profit organization in Egypt, Knowledge Economy Foundation. And we are working with farmers, addressing uh, issues from a farmer-centric point of view. And uh, what you have analyzed can very well apply to many African countries. It does correspond to the Egyptian situation and we are in North Africa. One comment which 
I would like you to think about so that we can take it up later on is that uh, the analysis you've made, the recommendation you've made are on the perfect, I mean, they are exactly on the dot. A question though, uh, who would be doing what? Because some actions are of a public relation, a public uh, uh, implementation aspect. Others are probably better dealt with at the private level. And then of course, there's a question of encouraging funders to fund public private partnership to address those questions. Uh, could we have Mr. Mohamed Awrash, I think he has been with us from the beginning. And now we're moving to North Africa. Mr. Awrash is from Morocco and a PhD student at the University of Abdel Malik Saadi. And he has won many different prizes, both in Europe and Germany specifically and Morocco. And he was among the top finalists in the Euromed Hackathon. Choosing an authentic food for everyone in Africa is a challenge and is as vital as saving lives from COVID-19. We believe that this challenge must be achieved and we are going to play a key role. Farmers at the front line are exposed to pesticides. Those pesticides pollute our soil, our precious water and our food. As a result, our planet suffers and people suffer as well from health problems. That's why our focus at BEP is helping farmers by providing a safer and more sustainable biopesticide. Good. That's interesting. Uh, do you have your, I know that you have your presentation as well. Oops. There is Gaetano. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Yes, that's yes, that's the one. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an incredible honor to be invited to an occasion that has a significant impact in today's agriculture in Africa. First, let me tell you about our innovation. BEP is a natural product designed to control two of the most destructive diseases that touches tomato cultures, that are fusarium wilt and gray moon. Our product is the result of six years of working hard for the formulation of a new biofungicide. From the selection of plants, we used not any plants, but uh, plants known to possess medicinal properties. To the optimization of the extraction of bioactive compounds responsible for the suppression of the diseases. The work was done with our partners, Faculty of Sciences and Techniques of Tangier, University of Malik Saadi, Morocco, and the Institutes of Viticulture and Agri-Food Research, University of Cadiz, Spain. Our uh, preliminary product has shown a success in laboratory and greenhouse conditions and is effective as uh, synthetic chemicals used to control these diseases. And also our products has enhances the plant growth and also crop yield. Next slide, please. Next one. Next one, please. In our team, we believe in adapting the right product to the country environment. 
is the first key to success. Let me tell you about agriculture in Morocco. Agriculture in Morocco is dominated by small farmers, but will actively target tomato growers that have incomes less than $10,000 per year. In the first place in the large region, northwest of Morocco, after that on the whole country. Our continuous goal that our label becomes one of the key players at the world market of biopesticides. The second key is expertise and management on the ground. Let me tell you that we already established a close collaboration with farmers from a large region so that we can match our products with their requirements. The third key to success is funding. We have invested until today $30,000 in our preliminary product. And we have plans for uh, $100,000 for, for the, two, the next two years. The fourth key is the legal system. We are working on it. We will have the necessary permits to begin production and to access to the Moroccan biopesticide market next year. We estimate to begin production by mid of September 2021. Uh, next slide, please. In uh, our team, we believe that uh, regulations are uh, really a problem because uh, regulations are the same as chemical pesticides, which add additional uh, expenses. They have to be solved as soon as possible. And also uh, the low investment in biopesticide uh, research because it's mainly from public sectors, it requires more, more encouraging the private sector to, to enter to this business. Uh, next slide, please. The key players in the biopesticide market in Morocco are uh, big companies like uh, Bayer, Bazefet, Syngenta. They are all, they produce their, uh, their products outside Morocco and they sell it inside Morocco. Uh, the other problem of biopesticide is their higher prices compared to cheaper synthetic pesticides. Our product idea is to build biopesticide that is cheaper, safer, and more sustainable to be able to target the Moroccan market. Next slide, please. In our team, we believe in positive coordination between all actors, governments, companies, corporations of farmers and people to improve the position of biopesticide industry, which has a significant impact in today's and tomorrow food and nutrition. We have to encourage young startups and also we have to wake up farmers to be aware of the danger of synthetic chemicals. And last, I want to say awareness is vital to make the change. Thank you. Dora, sorry, we cannot hear you. You have to unmute your mic. Sorry. I was okay. losing it because of the traffic noise. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, I was commenting on the suggestion to develop the biopesticides, which is, of course, a crucial question. I can tell you that in Egypt as well, the uh, registration and control of uh, chemical or synthetic pesticides is indeed in place and uh, very controlled and very well managed under the aegis of our Minister of Agriculture. The question of biopesticide is still open. Uh, and that I believe is definitely a valuable question to take up as a regional uh, subject in terms of research and innovation, but as well in terms of opening potentially this market to uh, startups because the entry ticket for biopesticides 
is less expensive than, of course, the chemical pesticides. But that is a long debate. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Isaac Sessi. I'm the founder of Sessi Technologies, an agri-tech startup based in Ghana. Our vision is to create and live in a world where poverty and hunger does not exist. And we are doing this by empowering farmers with affordable technologies to help them reduce losses, increase productivity, and maximize profits. We have developed an effective and easy to use grain moisture meter called GrainMate as well as a platform that links smallholder farmers with premium markets. We have adopted available storage technologies and have combined all of these into one package for farmers. Farmers are able to access this package and pay for it with their grain produce. Moisture, storage and market access related problems contribute to the majority of post-harvest losses in Africa that is faced by African farmers. And we believe that by combining moisture, storage, and market access solutions together and delivering it to farmers in a way that they are able to pay for, we can significantly cut down on hunger and lift farmers out of poverty and hunger as well. We believe that we can win this fight against hunger and we are continuing to do our part to ensure that this happens. Well, that is very ambitious. Uh, good. Uh, I, I didn't have time to properly introduce our uh, friend Isaac Senusesi. He is from Ghana, and he is uh, he must have he does have several hats. As uh, besides CC technology, he uh, has a BSc in electrical and electronic engineering, but he has also established a foundation. Uh, to uh, support a young African. He has trained up till now 3,000 young people in Africa to STEM technologies. So bravo, you're not only taking, you're also giving to, to the continent. That's very good. I believe we can uh, up here, uh, Mr. Isaac, continue his presentation now. Hi everyone, uh, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, hi Dora, I hope you can hear me. All right, sure. Um, thanks a lot for the opportunity to present the work that we are doing at CECI Technologies and how it contributes to this um, important topic of food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. Um, so can you, next slide please. So um, I'm, I'm, sp I'm speaking on innovation and digitization in agriculture, uh, more specifically how we can adopt post-harvest management technologies uh, and deliver them to small holder farmers in a way that they are able to, to pay for. And uh, we have seen that uh, we, we, it's, it's, we know that technology has a big part to play when it comes to being able to reduce post-harvest losses. And uh, I, I, unfortunately, there are a lot of things that have, have made it difficult to, for farmers to adopt these technologies. And um, not only farmers alone, um, can you move to the next slide, please? And uh, so if we're going to ensure that more people adopt technologies, there are some of the things that we have to look at or that we have to address um, when it comes to that. Can you please move to the next slide? So, so the first uh, thing is to 
educate the different key stakeholders on the importance and the benefits of adopting some of these technologies. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's one of the things that we have discovered in working with over the uh, 5,000 farmers that we have been working with so far, that market, uh, market education is important because you have no idea the number of people who don't know about such technologies at all. Uh, we also have to ensure that people, another factor that will determine the adoption of technology in post harvest mitigation is for the willingness of all, agree, um, all value chain actors to um, adopt the technology across the entire value chain. But that is only possible if there is a strong and a visible incentive for the value chain actors to do so. And um, an infrastructure also has to exist to deliver these technologies when needed. And um, so in just to talk about what we have been doing or how we have been doing it, one of the things we have been doing to create market education is to work with farmer-based organizations to introduce our affordable grain moisture meters to them and pair them with hermetic storage we set up different experiments. Uh, my friend from Nigeria actually mentioned that, um, that's Gabriel mentioned that you, you can't just, flyers don't work when you're dealing with farmers. They have to see the thing working in order to um, ensure that they want to adopt it. So we set up all of these experiments over a number of months, um, three months to six months. And after those six months, the they come and see the quality of the grain after using all of the technologies that we provide. And then they are more convinced that this works and they are more willing to adopt it. Can you go to the next slide, please? So now the overarching theme here is what, what, what can we do to safeguard global food security and uh, reduce poverty among people, especially at the bottom of the pyramid, while also creating uh, safe food for, for consumers, because usually you realize that consumers are the most removed from the value chain. A lot of people don't know where their food comes from and um, the processes the food goes through before it gets to their plates. And some of the practices we have seen farmers do uh, uh, you realize that if people knew exactly how some of the food they eat was being uh, handled, it would be a problem for them. So another thing also is to, uh, how, what do we do to ensure that food that gets to the final consumer is, is safe? So next slide, please. Now in our line of work, uh, we, the key stakeholders we have identified that are involved in this grain value chain include smallholder farmers uh, who are usually the people that grow the grain, 80% of all of the grain grown. We have grain aggregators who buy the grains generally from these smallholder farmers. We have the input suppliers that supply them the pesticides and the weedicides and fertilizer. Uh, we have governments who also provide extension services and uh, other sorts of support like subsidies. We have food processing companies who buy grains from the irrigators. We have consumers and then other value chain um, providers like people who offer threshing services and so on. And so all of these people need to accept, um, need to accept these interventions and these technologies bef before it's going to work. Because for instance, if a farmer buys a hermetic storage bag, um, who, who does the, the cost? Is the cost passed down to the aggregator who is buying the grains? Um, if not, the smallholder farmer will say, I don't see the reason why I should commit a, lot, a large amount of money to buy a hermetic bag if the grain aggregator is not going to pay for it. So everybody has to be involved in accepting these um, technologies before it's is uh, valuable to everybody. Next slide, please. Uh, could you move to the next slide? 
Okay, so I think that now um, what is going to what is going to enhance the adoption um, of or what's going to enhance the cooperation of these identified stakeholders include um, policies that that encourage the use of technology along the value chain, and also regulations to ensure better adherence to food safety procedures. Uh, but the most important thing is for the system to be built in such a way that everybody has a natural incentive to want to adopt these technologies. If uh, the people downstream are willing to, to pay a premium um, for good quality food, the people upstream are more willing to invest in um, what is going to make food of good quality. So I think that also natural incentives that make people want to um, do the right things and then adopt technology is very important. And for us as a startup that has been working for the last two and a half years, um, we're looking to work to create those kind of natural incentives for all of the stakeholders that we work with so that we see more people um, adopting technologies. And the goal for us is to empower them with these technologies to um, help them reduce losses, increase uh, profits, and then maximize productivity. We also believe that Africans have the capability to develop homegrown technologies that solve problems in Africa. So a lot of our technologies are designed, in fact, all of our technologies are designed and built in-house, and it's um, something that we're very proud of. So it's, if anyone is working in the green value chain, that sees a way we can collaborate. We're very happy to work with them. Thank you very much. Dora, please switch on your microphone. Thank you very much, uh, Isaac. That was really very good. And it presents still an additional facet to the whole of the relations between the uh, startups and the, their ecosystem. And what's uh, quite interesting is that up till now, all our uh, startups have been focusing on small farmers because this is indeed the one uh, sector missing uh, and that's the area where they can best and more quickly uh, implement their operations. Thank you very much. I believe that we can now uh, introduce Mr. Mikael Ogundare, who is from Nigeria. And uh, he's going to present to us uh, the different activities developed within his company, Crop to Cash Limited, uh, mainly focused on integrating farmers into the agri-food systems by analyzing their creditworthiness and performance. There he is. Hi, my name is Michael Gunari, and I'm the CEO of Crop to Cash. I'm very happy to be here and to be a part of the panel of the long-term EU-AU research and innovation partnership for food and nutrition security and sustainable agriculture. Um, at crop to cash we are working on interesting ways to make access to finance much easier for farmers because what we generally do at crop to cash is to make formal financing accessible to smallholder farmers in Nigeria and we've developed um, systems that can integrate farmers into the agri-food systems uh, by analyzing their performance and credit worthiness. Uh, there's a lot that we'll be sharing over the next few minutes and I'll be um, very happy to take your questions after uh, my presentation. Thank you.
Michael. Hi, everybody. Um, okay. Thank you very much uh, for having me today. Um, I think we should just go on straight to the next slide um, since the video already gave a brief background of what we'll be talking about today. So generally um, in Nigeria, uh, tens of millions of farmers in Nigeria are financially excluded. It's really hard for them to get access to credits. And um, we all know how um, growth and development and the increase in farmers productivity can be positively impacted if they actually have access to credit. Now, um, for a lot of farmers, um, the challenge for them is that um, the typical uh, sources of credit for them is through financial institutions or through cooperatives that are close to them. But then um, these systems or these institutions that exist, are they don't really see the farmers as credit worthy because the farmers themselves don't really have any proof or any way to show how they've been uh, performing in the past. So for example, if a farmer um, uh, is growing rice on a, on a one hectare land in 2019, and they want to access credit um, in 2020, uh, most of the farmers have no physical proof or any sort of record to say that, hey, I made um, 1000 tons on this farm. And because I made 1000 tons on this farm, it should give me credit because I'll be able to make um, as much as that or even more. So um, measuring the credit worthiness of farmers is really hard uh, because there's just no way to prove it. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. So, uh, but for the farmers generally in Nigeria and even all over Africa, their harvest actually speaks for them because um, if they don't have these records and all they have is just um, the results from their harvest and the people that they've sold to in the past, then that is really all they have to show that um, this, is how, um, this is how I have been performing in the past. And for someone like you and I on this call right now, if you were to get some sort of credit from a bank, what would you need? Um, one of the key things that the, the bank would ask for is your bank statement how money has been coming in or how money has been going out. Have you actually been receiving money? But in the case of farmers that are financially excluded, uh, there is almost no proof for that. So the only way they can really prove how they've been, how they, how they can be credit worthy is through their harvest. And that's why it speaks for them. But then um, this isn't of course generally available for the farmers. And but for us at Crop to Cash, we've figured out ways to, uh, make this information or data accessible or digitally accessible by using remote sensing and machine learning to go back in the past to analyze the uh, performance of a farmer. Now, if we go on to the next slide. So for, for, uh, for that to happen, the GPS coordinates of the farms is something that needs to be captured. And to capture that, um, cheap Android uh, phones can easily be used. And once the, once the coordinates have been captured, then these coordinates are things that can then be passed on to remote sensing um, technology service provider. And you can now retrieve uh, the past information of that particular farm plot, and then use machine learning to determine the historical data of the farmer's yield. If you can know the historical data of uh, the yield of the farmers, then you can pretty much just um, uh, take that information, compare that with the crop pricing at that particular period in time to determine what the performance of the farmer was, or to even determine how much the farmer would have actually made in the past. That way, um, in the normal case for you and I, that we would have to provide bank statements to a bank to get um, credit. In, their, in the case of smallholder farmers, all they need to do is use a system such as this to get to get the actual, the digital proof of their performance and to provide that to a bank and say, hey, this is what my performance has been like for the past five years. Now you can give me credit. Next slide, please. Now, generally to make all of these things work, um, the, uh, the pricing concerns generally includes access to uh, remote sensing technology or machine learning know-how. And then using this, using this access to digitally measure the performance that can unlock financing for these farmers. 
Um, this is something that we've actually um, also, we've done a couple of surveys in Ghana too, to find out if this is something that could actually work there. And the results we actually got was quite interesting too. And this is the sort of technology that can actually be taken to as many African countries as possible, because for a lot of farmers, or when you're talking generally about um, uh, the financially excluded, a major bulk of the financially excluded are smallholder farmers. So making it much easier for them to access finance by using remote sensing is a pretty, pretty big deal. Next slide, please. Now, but for that to work, um, we the, this this important factors need to be in place um, to capture the uh, on the ground data of the GPS coordinate. Extension agents are needed. There should at least be like a very strong network of extension agents that probably have um, Android phones that can map uh, the farms of uh, these smallholder farmers. Now, once the once that data is captured, it will be much easier to then pass that on to remote sensing. Um, um, service providers such as Airbus or Google or any other organization that is doing um, remote sensing um, services. But then to make all of this work very well, development organizations are actually uh, a very key, uh, a very key player in the entire ecosystem of all of this, because um, a lot of development organizations uh, work in different countries in Africa. Um, they have deep roots with the small order farmers and with um, state government and um, other value chain actors that can be important to making all of this work. And at the end of it all, all this information is really just to get financial institutions themselves to provide credit to the farmers. Next, please. So um, some of the conditions that are actually needed to make it work are the resources to capture these data. Um, that's um, KYC data, know your customer data for the farmers, um, knowing basic information about the farmers, the GPS coordinates, and eventually using this information to determine the historical yield of the farmers. Now, development organizations, as I said, are needed interfaces. Um, they help to make the entire um, conversation between the smallholder farmers, the aggregators and the, and the rural communities, the community leaders, the state governments, they make that entire conversation much easier. And at the end of it all, if something like this is going to work in, um, in Nigeria or in any other African country, the buying of the heads of agriculture or financial institutions is also needed because traditionally the financial institutions would still um, would, if a system like this doesn't exist, they would still ask for the um, normal documentation that they would ask for someone that lives in an urban area to access credit from a farmer that lives in a rural area. So um, whatever the results that um, a system like this is bringing out must be simple enough for the financial institutions to make data-driven decisions and to make it very easy for them to get credit. But to a large extent, credit is really just the first step. And what happens afterwards, after the farmers get access to credit, is the icing on the cake. It is what really makes um, access to finance really work well. Because if a farmer gets access to credit today, but they don't get access to the right services that will, um, that will ensure their success, then it might be very hard for them to get access to credit tomorrow. Because if they don't pay back, <laughs> um, getting access to credit um, the next time is very, very hard. So um, access to credit is really the first step but access to um, the essential services that they need, um, uh, great seeds, um, access to mechanization services, insurance, and all, and all the other things that they need to have a successful harvest, they are very important. Next slide, please. Now, for us at Crop to Cash, um, we've built um, a machine learning model that can actually do all of this. And we've done, we've piloted this with um, um, hundreds of farmers in Kaduna State in Nigeria along with a financial institution. And uh, for 2021, we're actually looking forward to scaling this to um, more states in Nigeria, more banks, and hopefully towards Q4 of 2021, get this to another African country. Thank you very much. Dora. Thank you, Michael. Yes, yes, I'm here. This is, uh, that was really, really interesting. 
I, what I can share with you without mentioning names is the question of credit worthiness as well as finding uh, solutions which could be used by all financial institutions in order to improve uh, agriculture finance and specifically at the level of the small farmer is a, is a top question. This is a subject which could definitely be of interest to the funders we are working on uh, uh, attracting to our future platform here. And the whole question of agriculture finance, making it easy uh, to all financial institutions to fund farmers is a major, major question. Of course, it relates to developing standards, ideally agreeing with international organizations as to what could possibly be the standards to be adopted. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Michael. That was really good. I believe we have now our last speaker and maybe uh, we have uh, a little bit of time for uh, Louise who finally managed to get near a good connection. But first we would like to hear Dr. Stefan Edward Moore from Ghana again. And uh, Dr. Stephen is a lecturer at the Department of Mathematics at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. And he is a specialist in modeling diseases, artificial intelligence and computational science. And uh, he is back in Ghana after 10 years in Europe and to establish iFarms and he's going to tell us all about it. Dr. Stephen, please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I think you play, you are going to play the, the video first. I'm Dr. Stephen Moore. I'm a co-founder of Integrable Farms. We started this farm 2019 May. Um, since then, we've grown about 1,000 seeds of mango. We've also had uh, 6,000 sockets of cassava and about 3,000 of the plantains on this farm. Um, so far, we've harvested all the maize, uh, which we had about in excess of 3,000 kilograms harvested. Uh, since uh, we began this farm, the main idea is a mango farm. So far, we've grown about five acres of 64 acres. We are hoping to expand into having about 10 more acres added of mango seedlings. Uh, the main idea is that we will be employing some modern technologies to help us grow the farm. This includes uh, using things like uh, drones for imaging and for disease predictions on the farm, and as well as to help guide the growth of the farm. Uh, some difficulties on the farm is uh, human theft or theft from humans around us. Uh, we also have difficulty with monkeys and some other animals that are surrounded the farm. We decided to develop this farm mainly to grow mangoes. We planted about 900 seeds of mango on the farm. Since it takes time for the mangoes to grow, we decided to grow maize, planting, and cassava to make use of the land. We also have issues with monkeys coming to steal the food from the farm. Since we live far away from the farm, we have people coming to also steal from the farm. Besides everything, we are passionate about working on the farm. We need money to extend and work on the farm intensively. So far, most of the works done is by labor. We employ about 100 workers, about 70 of them are females, and about 30 of them being males. For the cassava and for the maize, they are basically to sell to the locals around us, and also to use it as a means to train them on using the right procedures to grow these um, readily available vegetables or crops around. The aim is to involve really modern technologies in growing the farm and to serve as an advisory farm services 
to the many farmers in this locality and in this region at large. Okay, Dora, so um, you also have my slides. Yes. Let's wait for a few few seconds, maybe. Okay. There we go. All right. So, um, so slides number one. Uh, so we can start. So yeah, uh, this is this is myself. I'm the co-founder and the lecturer. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Integrable Farms, the farms that we spoke I spoke about, and then a lecturer at the Department of Mathematics. Uh, in Cape Coast. So next slide is a bit of the organization of the team, uh, the people uh, that I'm working with currently. Uh, I have a finance officer, I have uh, an operating officer, and I have a development officer. But all of them, they are not part-time. They are I, All of them are just uh, people I rely on to give me knowledge and ideas on how to do things in Ghana currently. Uh, the fact that the idea that the farm we the farm we, we started the farm last year, so you can see that is we are almost in one year since we began the farm, and so far it's a lot of experiences, a lot of things that we did not know about, a lot of things that we had no ideas about. Uh, for the first one year, we have learned we have learned a lot. Uh, we have already harvested maize and cassava from the farm. And this was uh, to help us know the terrain, to help us identify some of the uh, challenges with where we were stay, where we started a farm, to help us get uh, contact with farmers who will be able to collaborate with and help us to develop this farm. So these are some of the, see, these are my core team members for now. So next slide. Okay, so, uh, the main idea for the farm is to we, we the idea is to really have a mango farm. It's, it's, a, it's a mango farm. Currently, we have about um, five acres of seedlings planted. Uh, unfortunately, when we requested for more seedlings, we could not get more seedlings to plant, and so we had to wait. We have to wait for about six months to get the seedlings to plant. And whilst we were waiting, we decided to plant, uh, go into maize uh, for some parts of the farm. Plant maize, plantain and cassava in this area. So we could also get uh, some benefit or some use already for the land and sell to pay off some of the monies we, we are making. Uh, we, we've been investing in the farm just to help pay off the workers uh, whilst they whilst working there and also not to invest so much of our personal capital in the farm. Um, but so far, we have about 1,000 seedlings of mango and it's very young. We, we, we started planting early part of this year. So somewhere uh, in January, February, we started planting the mangoes. So you can see that it's very, very new. Everything is very fresh. The maize we start we planted has already grown. We've harvested them, but the mangoes are still really very in their elementary stages. The idea is that we we will be deploying some technologies to help us grow the farm, to develop the farm, and one of them is using drones. Uh, we'll be employing these drones to kind of to take pictures, so imaging. We will be taking imaging of the of the farm on weekly basis. So every week we'll be, we'll be taking drones and we'll be pick, taking pictures. Every week we'll do, we'll do it maybe twice or once um, based on the weather conditions and then the patterns available. But we hope that this will provide us a huge amount of data, especially for to help us grow the farm in the first place. And then this data will also help us to tell exactly the history of the farm, of growing a mango farm in this area of Ghana. So mango is really, um, uh, in the whole world currently, as of 2018, the, the whole world had about 55 uh, million tons of mango produced. And of this, 10% came from Africa. 
uh, and about 39 of these came alone from India. So the mango, the idea of the mango is also to tap into the mango industry, into the import and export services as well, to export basically to Europe uh, and to US as well. And so the drone technology and the artificial intelligence, our idea is will help us to really know how mangoes grow and to help us also capture diseases wherever there are outbreaks of diseases or pests on the farm just by using the images that we've been capturing over the period or over the number of weeks or months. And this will help us to also uh, plan ahead of time. Currently we've ordered for about, um, we've ordered for about 20 pieces of NPK detectors. So we are going to plant this as well in the soil. We will be planting these things in the soil to give us ideas, the weekly or daily ideas of the NPK values in the soil. And so all this is just to help us get precisely or a way of telling us how much or what, what is needed for the farm in terms of growing the farm. And then what is needed for the farm in terms of uh, fertilizers or in terms of pesticides, in, uh, in, uh, adding pests or in introducing pest management or control methods. Next slide, please. So critical factors for development for us is that um, as I as you uh, as I said earlier in the video, uh, we had we, we we had to employ about hundred workers. All were weeding on the farm. They came with cutlasses and hoes. They had to do a, a huge five acre play, weeding and play, uh, preparing the land just for growth of these crops. Uh, but really, some of the main ideas are. Just mechanization. Uh, if we can get uh, some tractors that can do this for us, it's very helpful for us. Uh, what we realized actually was that when we hired a tractor to come and to come and uh, help us weed the farm, we realized we even saved cost. We saved some amount of money compared to using human labor to do this. So this already gives us idea of trying to mechanize the farm uh, in terms of. Uh, tractors in, term, in terms of harvesters and all these areas. Also the labor quality. The people in the area that we are doing, the most of the labors we are using now uh, to weed the farm, they've been used, these are practices they've been using over several years. So the, the quality has been for many years of doing the same things. Uh, some of the uh, people who are helping us ad give advice on the land area, or which side of the farm to do to do to plant produce or not have all been uh, the labor the I, the knowledge they have you could see that is from the layman's point of view and being a research person I also try to read constantly on what must be done and I realize that the labor we have is also not very strong enough and so the idea with a critical factor is the labor the quality of the labor we have. Uh, we are we are using currently and then uh, storage facility is also a critical factor uh, after for instance after we harvested our maize uh, just in august after we harvested our maize uh, we had about three thousand kilograms of maize uh, left and we, we were a bit uh, lost us in what to do with the maize so but thankfully we are we've been able to build a, a storage facility and we kept all the 3,000 kilograms of maize that we could not sell immediately in this in this place. And we it already gives us an idea of storage facility or storage problems when we also start harvesting mangoes, for instance. So these are also critical factors, uh, ability to store these and keep them for longer periods. So next slide. And then pressing thematic areas uh, for us is so far, for instance, so far, all the financing we've had are just private funds. It's, uh, it's myself and my dad. Uh, we are using uh, the monies we have personally to do everything just for, for ourselves. So flexible, if we get for flexible financing of, uh, of equal sharing, equal profitabilities or interest, this will help very much. And also training, uh, this is also training so training us in terms of the labor, for instance, the people we are using, we realize that the, they are the quality of training, do not have a lot of training. So training opportunities uh, in terms of knowledge, training of mango farming, 
or knowledge training of how to handle finances or management of the farm will be very, very helpful. Uh, the other aspect, uh, which is also a priority concerning us is, for, is cost of the machineries that we, uh, we are using currently. So currently we are hiring all our machinery. We're using machineries from so many areas uh, and, and then an association. So we, we are very new. We started farming just this year, planting the mangoes this year. Uh, so now we are looking for associations to relate with. Please, next slide. So- the, Dr. Yeah. Stephen, could you please uh, accelerate a little bit because we, yes. are, uh, so this is, we this still is have two the, persons and we is, need to uh, conclude this This is almost the last slide. This is almost okay. the last slide for us. Uh, so, um the main uh, areas uh, critical the important players that we are looking forward to working with is the ministry of food and agri uh, because they they will be able to help us provide the right seedlings for us as i said we we, we are still lost with how to get seedlings for the mangoes um or west africa center for crop improvement we hope to also that we get contact with them or WASCAL, the West Africa Science Service Center also on climate change, on which part of the land or which regions, which areas we can use, and African Union and European Union as well. And this is why we live for FNSA, NFSA is very good for me as well, for us. Next slide, please. So to enhance our, our cooperation, uh, we hope to have business to business, connecting farmers to buyers, uh, if we have our seedlings or if we have a harvest, where to go? And then research to business, so training opportunities for new seedlings, if there are new seedlings, how we can acquire them, or a database of farmers where we can also add our names to it as a, as a farm, and then machinery or services advisory from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, and importations, if we import staffs, what we can benefit from. Next slide. So thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, so far what we've been doing. We started the farm last year, and this is what we have achieved. And we hope that the, benefit, the knowledge we acquire over the periods, we'll, be, we'll share them and we'll provide, we'll use it as services for several other farmers in this area and train them and help in the labor market as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, you are confirming what your colleagues have also been mentioning before, which is the, the absence of linkages and the necessity to focus on linkages as one of the very important tools to develop and possible topic for our future LEAP for FNSSC platform. Yes. I understand that we still have one gentleman, yes. Mr. Edmund Gual. Gualago, I'm sorry, I'm not pr pronouncing it properly for sure. He, uh, Edmund is from Tanzania and has created the Nguala inventions to develop uh, the yield and income by the use of technology to access biopesticides and biofertilizers. Uh, along the line of your colleague a moment ago. Please, Mr. Edmund, go ahead. Hi, I am Edmond Mwalango, founder of Mwala Invasion. I'm Delfina Poncian, co-founder of Mwala Invasion. Mwala Invasion is a private company registered in Tanzania to solve the problems of lack of accessibility and affordability of organic pesticides to smallholders farmers. Solving the problem, we have come up with a digital farm input supply approach that involves digital community shared tanks connected with prepared meters to allow small the farmers accessing organic pesticides within their premises, even if they have little amount of money. To access organic pesticide, farmers will pay through their, mo through their mobile phones and receiving the codes and then setting the code to prepared meters, allowing, the, allowing organic pesticide flowing from the tanks to farmers' bushels. We are on the final process of developing our prototype and soon we will test it to small farmers in East African countries that are Tanzania, Uganda, Sudan, Kenya and Rwanda. Already we have more than 30,000 farmers who have 
interest with our technology. And these farmers will, will benefit from our technology since our technology will help them to increase yields, income, good health and well-being, but also protecting the environment since it ignores the use of packages. Thank you. Fine, that is the presentation, I suppose, yes. Hello, do we have you? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, I am Edmond Mwalago, the founder of Mwala Invasion in Tanzania. We are di digitalizing the agro input system. Uh, and starting with, we have started with biopesticide and biofertilizer. Next slide. Uh, our innovation relies on, in, uh, relies on innovation and digitalization in agriculture, but also is, but also is it's a agroecology transition of food system, new ideas to link the to link it together the health because we are distributing biopesticide and biofertilizer. Next slide. Our critical factors. Uh, agro input skills, uh, knowledge and passion of our team has led us to save 150,000 smaller farmers from East Africa, improving their yields and income from using our digital services and product. Uh, but also as a startup who, who we need to reach 42 million smaller farmers from Sub-Saharan African countries, Supplying them with biopesticide and biofertilizer using our digital innovation when we need collaboration and assistance in these areas. Technology. Our digital technology that we, we have innovated of using public digital tanks that are connected with prepared meters still need development to overcome the current challenges occurring during operation. Uh, the last step is Last but one is the skills. We need more skills in agro input, human centered design, agro input business model development, and agro input data engineering. And the last point is finance. Uh, after <coughs> supported technological and skillful, we need funds to expand now our business, reaching for two million smaller farmers from Sub-Saharan African country by the year 2023. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Uh, Edmond. Can you hear us? Hello? Hello? It's a toward high yields and income. Hello? Hello? Yes. Do you hear me? Hello? Hello? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Now let me speak why shift from manual delivery to digital delivery of uh, agro inputs. Uh, deliver biopesticide and biofertilizer to small the farmers within their premises. So uh, it has been the problem that uh, these small the farmers have been lacking access to biopesticide and biofertilizer. But even if they have access to them, they receive them rate that make their products already being damaged and destroyed. Uh, but also another factor is farmers now can access our biopesticide and fertilizer at any quantity uh, because now we are using the tanks and these tanks are public, are general for public. So 
farmers now will access any amount now from those tanks and they are so they will be uh, they are installed at one stop agribusiness centers uh, another point is the environment friend now this system now does not pollute the environment uh, as we are not using the common method of packages no bottles this time we will have only uh, one tank a big tank a digital one at one stop agribusiness center which will be distributing now biopesticide and another tank about fertilizer to farmers who are residing in that particular area. Also, it's you know favoritism and the corruption. Uh, as you know, there has been this pro project that have been subsidized by the government, African governments, especially in Tanzania, subsidized to small farmers so that they can get this agro input at a cheapest price and the uh, on, on time, but uh, these have been failed because of these agro dealers are untrusted and uh, they were also selling the product at the original price, although it was subsidized. And that's why the government decided now to, to get out from those projects. But using this system now, it will encourage the government to invest now to help these small farmers because it's purely digitalized. No person on the tank, but it's the, the matter of the small the farmers and the, his or her electronic card or mobile phone purchasing the biopesticide from those tanks. Uh, but also efficiency uh, and the efficiency and data for decision making because these tanks are, are digitalized now. Every reader and the, every farmer who will be uh, accessing or getting biopesticide and the biofertilizer from these tanks where there will be a record, uh, a digital record. So it will be easy now to have know how, ma how many quantities of biopesticide and fertilizer, but also the names of the farmers because the system, it requires the farmer to use mobile phone or electronic card. So we, the system will capture the name of the particular farmer. Uh, next slide. Uh, can you, uh, Edmund, please. we really don't have time anymore. Can you please conclude? I'm sorry, uh, okay, but okay, okay. Okay, there's okay, no okay. Okay. Yes, yes, Thank yes. You. Okay, key actors are small, the farmers and non-government organization that are there to help these small order farmers increasing yields and income, but all the government agencies that are responsible for environmental conservation because uh, our tanks are uh, our tanks are clean to the environment, but also we are providing biopesticide and fertilizer that is friendly to the environment. Also, research institute. Uh, these are very important in uh, ensuring efficient and effective improvement of our digitalized digitalization. Also, climate change stakeholders, as uh, our biopesticide, it's a uh, it's not a chemical and so it does not affect the next slide. Now, con condition for enhancing actors are uh, sustainability. Edmund, we are Edmund, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, okay, well, sustainability sorry, contribution to toward. Okay, thank you. Fine. Uh, is Louise still here? Maybe yes. her presentation is... Louise? Hmm. Is Louise back again or...? No, Dora. Uh, no. She, well? She has uh, still... Yes. Uh, problems with the connection, so... I understand. Yes, well, okay. I, I believe that what we could do is uh, to uh, listen briefly to, or maybe not briefly, he had, norm he normally has 10 minutes to our expert, uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Guillaume Kess, who manages Cosmos Innovation Center. Are you, are you with us? Yes, Benjamin? I am with you, uh, Yes. So let me Great. let me do a quick quick introduction. So uh, Ben is 
the specialist in agritech. He has uh, been the program director for the Cosmos Innovation Center and nurtured over 500 entrepreneurs, 18 startups, and incubated 14 startups. And he's based in uh, Ghana, but uh, has been working in a number of regions as well. Uh, Benjamin has uh, developed up to uh, programs for up to 58,000 cocoa farmers and improved the livelihood of over 70,000 farmers through the use of ICT, ICT for agriculture. And uh, without further ado, uh, a very important point, Benjamin is also a farmer, not only a tech geek. Benjamin, please, the floor is yours. Right, thank you very much, um, Dora, for the warm introduction and a um, very um, good job to all the um, entrepreneurs who have presented their technologies and their businesses to us. And as you said, we don't have much time, so I'm just going to do um, a quick overview and some of the points that I wrote down um, whilst um, they were speaking. And I'll just respond briefly to each of the um, presenters. But to, before I do that, I, I, I just want to say that it is no doubt that application of advanced innovation and digitization systems such as the machine learning that we mentioned, artificial intelligence, computer version, vision, remote sensors, uh, sensing, unmanned aerial uh, vehicles as the, the drones and the internet of, of things has the potential of transforming Africa's agricultural sector under enabling conditions. And this is occurring globally and is using increasingly and is increasingly uh, being manifesting in the agricultural sector. Over the years for us at Cosmos Air Innovation Center, when we started this program, we've seen a lot of these uh, problems that uh, has been mentioned by the entrepreneurs um, on the uh, platform this uh, today, trying to solve them. And one of them that readily came to mind is the credit scoring, which is quite interesting when I got the, the deck to review. So generally, um, I will go straight to the point um, and just speak, give a general overview. So, so for Edmond, um, I think we, you need to look at uh, infrastructure costs because it could be high and um, you need to look at your um, unit economics. And, uh, and that would be a, a good thing, a very uh, good place to start from because it could hinder scaling of this particular uh, innovation than the business that you have. And Louise, uh, we, I would also want to ask a few questions. Unfortunately, we don't have her on the call now. Um, we wanted to understand where, who is the consumer of the content that she's providing and looking at the nature of our smallholder farmers. Are they on the YouTubes and other places? Do they have cloud services to benefit? That is also another place for you to look at so that you can channel the right information to the right target um, audience uh, for your business. And that is for Louisa. And also um, the um, Olusegu, also Rural Farmers Hub. Uh, it is a very interesting concept. And the, the, the most interesting part is that I have in the past worked with an organization that has used um, tools like this to work with uh, farmers. It's a very effective tool to work with farmers using um, USSD, SMS to reach out to farmers with the right information, market pricing, um, weather information, um, the crop protocols and what have you. But the very most important thing that you need to do is that to understand is that are the farmers willing to pay for this? How much are they willing to pay? The price points are very important for you to look at. And for instance, we in the past have worked with various organizations like the USAID and the, uh, and the defense who are running projects and use these to introduce technologies to farmers. But the question is when these funds are uh, over or the projects are over, are farmers willing to pay? Willingness and 
ability to pay is very important. And I, one of the things I was quickly learning is that you bundle services and that can be one good thing to do. So just like we have also mentioned um, that you are looking at uh, bundling services and also working with the corporate cooperatives, that could be a way to go. For uh, Edward, um, I think he talked about his, um, uh, the natural learning program to predict, uh, to do prediction. And from his presentation, he mentioned quite a few things. Key point we want to, we want to find out from uh, Edward is how does natural language processing help predict uh, possible droughts? And so we need to be very factual um, about some of these technologies um, when we want to introduce them. So, and then also when we have, want to get to the locals, we need to be very factual with some of these solutions. So you can help us with more information there, Edward, um, so that we can help you with um, uh, further comments. Right, so for micro crop to cash, which is very interesting, the credit scoring I mentioned just um, briefly um, ago. So one key, and you mentioned a latter part of your presentation, which is great, which means you have been able to identify it. The credit scoring in itself, it is not the problem. The biggest challenge here is recovery. And again, in my, my uh, past life, I work with a, a, comp a company that gave um, products or farm inputs to farmers on credit. Now, if you're able to bundle services and build loyalty, that is where the success is going to come from. So the technology itself is not your product, it's not your business, but the systems you build around the technology is going to help you to be successful. So that is what we want to, I want to give to you um, a crop to cash limited. Look at the systems and build on that so that you'll be able to be successful because the technology itself cannot be successful. And uh, Green Master from Isaac uh, Seno Sesi, a great product. Um, one question that I have for you and also, and I like the fact that you're also building um, products, other services around what you're doing, which is, which is great. But one thing I wanted to ask specifically to, or I want you to think about specifically to the Green Master is, what solutions do you provide to remedy the moisture levels when you have tested them to know whether there's too much moisture or that the moisture level is, 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 great, is so good? We talked about the storage systems, which is great that you're providing. How can we scale this? Because I think it's also very good for um, friends, prevention of aflatoxins, which are very, uh, which is very dangerous for, um, for all of us. And we need to figure out how we do, we take care of that. Uh, so biopesticide, which is a very interesting a concept that Dr. Muhammad presented. It is always um, a very expensive. And one of the points I wrote here for, for that is that it is always uh, quite a, a expensive compared to mm -hmm. the inorganic, as we have seen mostly on the markets. So the question is, how are you able to convince farmers to spend more on the biopesticides? Great innovation always in that, in, in that space, but it will get down to business at the point. So what business model are you going to present and how are you going to put it at the right price points for farmers to be able to afford? And I think if I'm looking at my list, this, uh, these are all the, uh, oh no, I, yeah, these are all the uh, presentations that came and my direct uh, feedback to all of them. So if um, Dora, you have any specific questions to, to me on this particular uh, feedback, I am ready to um, respond to it. And um, thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin. In fact, uh, I am now to deliver a five minute wrap up and I do suggest that we do it together. So okay. I'll start if you don't mind with the three findings and uh, the three uh, recommendations possible. And the three, so I'll start with the findings. So uh, what has really struck me is the fact that uh, all our idea carriers shared the same core findings. 
or either findings or strategies. The mm -hmm. first is that definitely they are all farmer centric. And that is so essential because that is again, the core problem. Uh, mm -hmm. With all due respect to the largest organization and funding agencies, uh, if uh, the idea carriers go on developing schemes and programs focused on small farmers, that clearly means that they are not part of their ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So that's the first key finding. And uh, obviously, a subject to look into uh, more, much more. The second is that in the panel one, we have been talking a lot about the theory of change. Uh, what we need to recognize here as the second main finding is that the, these young people have demonstrated that the engine of the theory, theory of change is ICT. In order to achieve the development and the revolution and the expansion we want to see in the area of FNSSC in Africa, it will go through ICT. And ICT involving, in particular, youth and women. The third main finding is the fact that they have all focused on value chain strategies and value chain linkages, whether forward or backward. And I personally endorse totally those three findings. I, what I can bring to the table is that is exactly the same analysis I could make in what concerns North Africa and specifically Egypt, where I have the pleasure to work. So about the recommendations. Uh, I would recommend three, mainly. One is to uh, really focus on bringing businesses and private sector to the table. Again, panel one has developed at length the issue of sustainability. And we have all lived the story of the projects which are funded uh, by major funders, but when the funding ends, the project ends and there isn't much legacy around the table. By bringing businesses and working on harmonizing their objectives with the objectives of research and innovation in FNSSA, we can piggyback on the businesses and, their, uh, and the business and revenues in order to sustain this um, uh, these, these programs, because then they will have a vested interest in maintaining them. The second relates to ICT, and as its recommendation, it is to address the absolute need to develop broadband in the whole of Africa, as well as the access to smartphones, which are not which would, should not be expensive, even bundle them with other products. But we will not be able to achieve ICT as the engine of the theory of change if we do not have major revolution in broadband coverage of Africa and give to literally each African farmer, woman and man, a cheap smartphone. We will not be able to do credit worthiness, financial inclusion without giving to the African those tools. And the final one in what concerns uh, an additional idea for the future platform is that with all this wealth of innovation, which the idea carriers bring to the table, that we could think of a mechanism which would be like some kind of a permanent jury uh, solution or panel which would validate these idea carriers, not only at their national level, but at a regional level or maybe at an African level. Because 
topics such as the biopesticide and biofertilizers. In North Africa, I mean, we have this colleague in Morocco already, but in Egypt, this would be a very interesting subject to develop. And because a number of those ideas are valid at a regional level. So I'm through with my findings and recommendations, dear Benjamin. Please go ahead. Right, great. Um, Dora, so I am going to make a, a very, just one sentence um, recommendation. And Good. it is all to support everything that you have said. Now, what I would say is that Innovation is the way to go and ICT is part of innovation and is a great way to reach out to our farmers, our first mile group that makes sure that we are all well fed. In doing this, look at the business model that you apply to reach out to the consumers. And you might, you might you must also want to know that who is your consumer and who is paying for this? Who wants to spend on this? There are times that the who the spender might not necessarily be the one who is going to consume the product. You need to have a clear distinction and understanding of that, which is very important. Define partnerships that you want to have, the collaborations that you want to have in this space. It is very important that in this space you are well you have the right partners to help you. Is it a research institution? Is it a development institution? Is it a university? Is it a business partner? And what kind of business partners are you looking for to work on, to look for, to execute? And most importantly, putting all this together and a nice recommendation Dora has given us is about execution. The way we execute is going to determine that all the innovations with the ICT tools that we have come up with is going to be successful, make the right impact as we are all looking for. And as I sit here today, I am very happy with what we've been able to do with Cosmos Innovation Center, where we bring in fresh entrepreneurs, let them create business idea with market research. So you don't create a business in a vacuum. You create having spoken to the right people in the industry to understand their pain points. And when you have done that, you have to test your model and make sure that the farmers or the recipients of the product have been able, uh, are willing to use it and are able to use it and also willing to uh, purchase them or spend on them. And then you right, realize that the impact is uh, will, will, be, will be felt out there. So in the, in the end, I'm going to stick to one key point, execution. Let us now have a very great execution um, plan well structured and then get out there and make this make the right impact. Thank you very much, um, Dora. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, Gaetano, who's is it Katerina who's taking over now? Yes, yeah, me, Dora. Here I am. Uh, thank you very much. Um, A lot has been said. Uh, we are now moving to the second part of uh, this panel on innovation and digitalization in agriculture, paving the way for entrepreneurs. Um, I would like to start with a very small exercise. If you all could uh, switch on your cameras and just uh, wave a little bit uh, to make sure you're still there. Uh, and you're alive. You're not lost somewhere in the cloud or in the space or in the internet. Um, I'm happy. Thank you, everybody, for staying along with us for such a long time. Uh, I believe we will have to delay a little bit uh, to make sure that everybody has the chance to speak who is on the agenda today. Uh, if there's somebody who really desperately needs to leave before, please let me know uh, so you can be the first speaker. We can rearrange the agenda a little bit. Um, is this the case for anybody? No, George. <laughs> Good. I, I can, I can go if necessary. 
No, please let's let's have a Thank short you. screenshot, see him team, just to make sure everybody is still there. Uh, I, a screenshot of this meeting. Uh, Okay, and now we go. So thank you for your patience. Um, on this panel, I would like to remind you about our first, our first objective. The first objective is to build this alliance of African, West African stakeholders, funders, researchers, entrepreneurs, farmers, farmers associations. Um, so I have the feeling we're doing good progress on this. Um, the second one is to work on a political level to align research ag agendas and funding agendas. And this was addressed mainly by panel one. But I would like to remind you that you will be contacted by Stefan and by Jackie, uh, who will invite you to join the sorting house mechanism and to be partner on the platform. Um, and our third objective is, of course, to um, pave the way for you, for young entrepreneurs, innovators, um, to become more popular, successful, and to build up your businesses. And the first speaker on uh, the part of this agenda, panel two, um, is a very interesting um, person. It's Andrea Cofobianco Dondona. He's from Nigeria. He's a vegetarian. Vegeta and the co-founder of Farm for Trade. Um, he has uh, over 15 years of experience in veterinary research and development field, uh, particularly on infectious diseases in the wildlife livestock documentary interface. Um, he is uh, responsible for training farmers, veget veterinarians and other stakeholders. And in September 2016, he has co-founded Farm for Trade, uh, which he's going to present right now. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. wondered how you can be more in control of your livestock farm? Have you been searching for a way for technology to assist you in leveraging your livestock productivity? Introducing Farm for Trade suite of apps, which lets you take control of your farm. Manage animal records with our farm management app. family situation on a budget with our feed formula app. Gain productivity insights with our business intelligence app. Record and re-identify your animals using AI biometric face recognition technology with our Snap Animal app. Offer animal transport pooling with our eMove app. And much more. The Farm for Trade app suite is an affordable and accessible tool to digitize your farm by seamlessly switching between your mobile devices and desktop computer browser. For times when the internet connection is unavailable, the apps can work in offline mode to let you keep working without interruption. The Farm for Chase suite of apps offers multi-farm and multi-user features. You can manage different farms and assign team members specific rules and permissions. The best part is they offer free versions of the apps. Download and learn more at farmfortrade.com slash suite.
Andrea, um, I think you can start. Yeah, if they can start the presentation, I can go ahead. I... Next slide, please. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you to the organization team for inviting Farm for Trade. Uh, as you have already seen, we are developing precision livestock productivity solution. So we can go ahead. Next slide, please. Our core product is an application, a suite of applications that aim to digitalize the livestock supply chain and serve all the stakeholders. It's a cloud-based platform where all the stakeholders can gain the better productivity and better information. The core of the suite is the farm management where you can keep record of all your animals, feeding information, health and reproduction information. And this first app is supported by the business intelligence where you have the analysis of the information you have typed in and then we have a series of other applications one that will help uh, the farmers uh, to match with the uh, transporters to move animals from one place to another. So it's a sort of a transport pooling application. Then uh, together with the GIZ, the, the German cooperation, we developed a feed formulation application, especially for Namibian farmers to use bush feed, but uh, this can be used uh, on uh, uh, by any any type of farmers everywhere in Africa and abroad. Then there is our core other application that is uh, leveraging artificial intelligence uh, to identify animals uh, using artificial intelligence. And then uh, we are on the process of uh, completing a marketplace that will allow the matching uh, of um, farmers that want to buy or to sell animals uh, to allow uh, intermediate cost and middlemen so that sometimes uh, really make the difference uh, in marketing uh, live animals on, um, on, on the market. And next slide, please. What are the critical factors uh, for and the limiting factors for farm for trade? Uh, definitely, because we are a cloud-based platform, uh, we, we need a, a large user base uh, to allow an exponential growth. And uh, we also need uh, quite a number of uh, users uh, to provide more feedback uh, compared to what we have. We already have 3,000 users uh, that are using the app, not just in Africa, but in many developing and uh, developed countries. And uh, this is also to leverage uh, the data collection and allow to improve the application. And uh, also because uh, on a scale base, if we have more uh, users that uh, will subscribe to the pro version of the application, we will get enough uh, money to, <coughs> to boost the company. And of course, uh, we come to the funding gap because we already invested uh, quite a lot of money um, since uh, the company was incorporated. We have a plan for funding for, the, for this year, next year, and there will be a funding gap of about 35%. 40% compared to what has already been invested. Next slide, please. Uh, what are our most um, important priorities? Uh, we definitely want to have a big social impact. Uh, and this is why, uh, although we are uh, at the border with uh, Europe, we are between Europe and Africa, we want to empower farmers with data. And this is to allow them to optimize productivity and uh, get access to credit and forecast their needs. We would like to work on reverting uh, rural abandonment because this really threatens uh, many economies in Africa and uh, also threatens food security in many countries. Uh, we, we are investing in community contribution to improve uh, the livestock ecosystem, and this will also turn into helping reduce uh, the environmental impact uh, by promoting livestock uh, efficient uh, practices. Uh, and overall, we want to support transparency and justice, uh, especially for the farmers, uh, because sometimes farmers uh, are too often exploded by market operators uh, and other art actors in the market. And uh, by having data, leverage data, this type of problem should be completely avoided or as much as possible. Next slide, please. 
Okay, what are the key actors? As I said, we have one main product that is the suite where we have most of the stakeholders, farmers, breeders, different operators like transporters, slaughterhouse, loan lenders. Uh, but beside the, the core of the um, of our products, so we have this uh, technology that we have been developing with the Italian government, uh, and we are experimenting also in Namibia. That is a contactless biometric photo identification of cattle. At the moment, we are working on cattle, but it can be extended to other species, uh, and this can be uh, integrated and used by governments uh, to develop a, a national animal registry. That the one uh, that are one of the biggest limits uh, uh, to allow uh, live exports of animals or animal products to other countries where there is no animal identification system in place uh, export to our richest countries like Europe or America it's not allowed and then we are also working on uh, a technology that allows the autom automatic identification of lesions in the abattoirs this is to respond to the um, lack of veterinarians or training trained operators that can do proper assessments in the abattoir all the time uh, and we are developing this technology at the moment for the pig sector but we are we are planning to expand this artificial intelligence technology to the other species next slide please uh, coming to the conditions uh, and the critical factors uh, to ensure um, to develop our application, uh, it's already been discussed and commented, but definitely we need uh, access to internet and device by most of the farmers and most operators that are involved uh, during the livestock uh, value, chain, value chain. Uh, there is also an issue of computer literacy because uh, not everybody has the knowledge how to use this type of tool. And then of course, uh, uh, all the stakeholders must get, uh, must get used to uh, using this application and the in industry must uh, also buy in. Uh, I haven't heard much about uh, property of data and legal framework, uh, but this is something that we are, we are also very aware of uh, because uh, property of data and how these data are protected and shared and used even by private companies is something that uh, up to a certain level must be agreed and uh, managed by the governments. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. I hope I've been uh, within my time. And if you have any question, uh, uh, I'm ready to answer. Thanks. Andrea, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, I have seen it before and I was very much impressed about how much you could concise the uh, key factors uh, for stress and uh, suggestions for improvement. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, then I would like to invite the next speaker. Um, and in order to save time, you can see, of course, in the chat room, um, his bio. Morigo Rubera, he's from Benin and uh, is an agronomist with six years of experience in the, in the development field. He worked for different NGOs and he is focusing on ICT usage in agricultural extension services. Welcome, the floor is yours. I will run, I will climb, I will soar. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Mohi Gubira, one of the founders of uh, Isara Consulting Cabinet. In Isara Consulting Cabinet, we believe in the power of uh, information and communication technologies to revolutionize agriculture in Africa. Before I go further, I would like you to think a little bit about how farmers get new information in agriculture. The main way we know is uh, through extension services, but the problem is in Africa. The ratio of farmers to extension agents is uh, 300 to 10,000 farmers per agent. So it is clear that there is a shortage of uh, extension agents throughout the continent. As a young agronomist, we ask ourselves this question. Why should we still continue using that old methodology of uh, training farmers? If technologies are around us, why can't we take advantage of them and uh, help farmers to work smartly? So we got a bright idea of developing a training system based on farmers learning video usage. What is it about? The system is actually pretty simple. 
work in partnership with some organizations. We work with Access Agriculture, which is a non-profit organization that produces some quality videos in agriculture. So we get those videos from them and also get them translated into local languages. We also work in partnership with Happy Service Mund in developing some training materials. So in the beginning, we started mapping all the problems that the farmers are confronted with in the country. We have developed different ways of training farmers. Video projections using a smart projector. It doesn't matter whether there is electricity in the village or not because the smart projector has a battery and a solar panel. We also transfer the videos into the phone that you can watch later. We also distribute some DVDs that you can watch once at home. We base our trainings on satellite approach, meaning that if you get a video, you have the responsibility to share the video with at least five of your peers to guarantee that we are impacting the many farmers at a time. Uh, with those trainings, we have uh, impact directly more than thousands of farmers, and those farmers are really improving their productivities. They are also making money out of our trainings. So that guarantee that they are making a better life. All in all, what I have to say, in the Sarah Consulting Cabinet, we believe in the power of ICTs to fight against food insecurity and promote sustainable agriculture. If you believe in our idea, join us and make it work. I would also like to thank the initiators of this event. Thank you. That was a nice one. Thank you. Do you also have a presentation that you would like to share with us? Yeah, I'm waiting. So why are we waiting? Uh, I can hear this. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you to all participants. Thank you to FNSSA for giving me this opportunity to present uh, what we do as activities to help farmers. Uh, we use ICTs, basically agricultural videos to inform farmers about good practices, agroecological practices. Next slide, please. So uh, through our topic, we address uh, innovation and digitalization in agriculture. As I said, uh, using agricultural videos, agricultural ecological videos to inform farmers about good practices. Next slide. In terms of uh, critical factors for development success or limiting factors, uh, first of all, I would like to mention low degree of farmers organization Benin, uh, because farmers are not well organized like in association to facilitate our activities. We, we also have a logic of assistance developed among farmers. Uh, farmers are used to receiving extension services, uh, free of course before. Uh, so now when we get our uh, solution to them, uh, sometimes uh, they, they don't get it easily. So uh, it's also something that limits what we are doing. We also have a low capacity of farmers to pay for the training and also limited equipment because now we have a one smart projector that we use uh, compared to the huge number of farmers that we have, uh, we can reach. So that also limits us a, a little bit in what we are doing. And uh, another limiting factor is a low ICT proficiency of farmers. Uh, because in our activities, we, we try to transfer at times uh, our video into farmers' phone. And uh, what we ask them is to transfer the same video on in the turn uh, to others farmers. So because of that problem, uh, some farmers have uh, difficulties to transfer the video to the peers so as to impact many farmers at the time. So let's slide. Uh, most pressing thematic here is uh, digitalization and uh, agriculture extension. So uh, in Benin, what we notice is that uh, digital solutions are available and also uh, extension uh, services are working separately. So it is that need to train those uh, two uh, categories, I mean, uh, the solution and the extension services, so to reach many farmers and uh, to let them work smartly. Next slide. Uh, talking about key actors, we have uh, farmers, 
uh, which represents here the backbone of what we are doing because the solutions are directed toward farmers. Uh, another key fact, uh, actor is ASIS Agriculture, which provides us with uh, quality videos, which helps us also to translate the video into local languages, so as to let farmers uh, learn about good practices easily, and also public agriculture extension services. And uh, other, fact, uh, other actors are uh, the laboratory and the uh, organizations that we are working with to develop some uh, uh, dissemination approaches so as to impact many farmers uh, using uh, different approaches. Next slide. Uh, in terms of conditions to enhance uh, what we are doing, we think that we have firstly to raise the stakeholders' awareness about the existence of the solution because the solution at times exists, but uh, people are not aware about how they can use it. It is uh, uh, something that we have to work on to just uh, let our idea be known. And uh, we also have to uh, create a platform that will gather the, the key actors so to come together and discuss about how to develop some approaches to reach farmers based on the solution uh, that we have developed. And uh, we also think that the government, for instance, in our country now, uh, if you are a startup working in extension uh, domain, you have to get an agreement. I mean, uh, accreditation from the government before allowing you to go to train farmers. So uh, it's not really easy for startup to, to get and uh, it also limit us in, in our area of intervention. Next slide. Thank you. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this was another good example how we um, provide services to farmers. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to call the next uh, speaker. Um, and this is a speaker from Nigeria, uh, one of four on this panel. Um, his name is Babatunde Manuel Olarawaju, and I try to do my best with, with the pronunciation. Um, on the right hand, you can see um, his bio in the chat. Um, and I won't say much, uh, except that he uh, has been working for many years in agricultural extension and was rural sociology. Uh, welcome, Babatunde. Okay, thank you so much. Research has shown that only 27% of food production actors can continue to carry out production for a maximum period of one month without external intervention, such as a resilient distribution system. In order to be food sustainable in a nation, in spite of those several challenges affecting the economy, we all need to move with the tides and embrace digital technology. At Fotox Hybrid Council Limited, we bring an innovation of an e-commerce virtual marketplace software application, AgriLens, which connects every actor in the agri Valley chain. Through AgriLens, you are able to market your produce and distribute it effectively and seamlessly. The uniqueness of AgriLens is the integration of a secured third-party payment system and logistic services. This will not only create more jobs, but honest partnership across several sectors, ensure responsible consumption and production of food. Also, it will improve food supply chain and easy accessibility to everyone. OK, 
Okay, good evening. Good evening, uh, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Baba Tunde. I'm the new strategist of Futuks Agricons Limited. On our idea, next slide. Uh, Futuks Agricons is a private extension company. So uh, what we do is do, we have digitalized agriculture. So these are sub team. Next slide. No, one of the key things of agriculture in Nigeria is productivity. And the main reason for the low productivity in Nigeria is the, that disconnection between farmers and markets. Many farmers only look out for markets within their community. So when there is a plot of blood, they find it difficult to get market outside their community. So our idea is an e-marketplace mobile application uh, it connects every actor in the agricultural value chain. And how it does that, next slide. How we intend to achieve this is uh, uh, we have different produce uh, that is being enlisted uh, on our platform. We have the prices of those produce. And we have a uh, key, two key things that's important on this system is this. Uh, there is an integration of logistic and payment platform. And for the payment platform, we use an escrow system where there's a payment that it, you only receive the payment after delivery. And there's a system where you can track your, the, the, you have, can track the whole process. After purchasing, you know where it is. As a farmer too, you can also track where your product is. And that is the my shop. From the my shop, you could see different product there and my transactions. You could see transactions that have happened maybe in the last one month, two months, three months. The next slide. So what is the critical factors for us? Price mechanism. And on the system, uh, the, the seller fixes our price. Uh, it's, it is a free you know, market I, system. I sent them uh, a round of the presentation. Uh, it's a free market account. system and where it. everyone, uh, as a seller, you could you could fix your price. So you could say, I want to sell my produce at one naira. The other one could say, I want to sell my produce at this naira or this dollar. So that's a one key critical factor. A verification of sellers. Presently at Futos, we actually offer a, a service called Futos Verify. It is a background check service where we check uh, agribusinesses and agricultural investment platforms in Nigeria, which we started the, the service about four months ago and it has fully been on grass. So there is a, there's a, there's a background check for every uh, seller or logistic company, any service provider on the system, which is a critical factor for us. Private extension services for farmers. Presently at Futos, we provide sub private extension services for farmers. And it's a critical factor for the success of this idea. And the last one is the onboarding sellers are committed to provide safe and healthy food and livestock. You know, one of the key things about food talk is that what we want to achieve is that farmers can produce food that are safe for consumption, both for man and animal. So we need to audit the, the, the sellers that, are, that will be on the system for us. Next slide, please. And uh, for the most pressing thematic priority, uh, we talk about the digital efficient food distribution chain, where we bring in the, the logistic companies uh, that can supply, that can actually uh, get the food from the farmer to anywhere within the country. We have logistic companies within the state and we have the logistic uh, company across the state. We have private extension services. This is one of the key things for us that we have already started in the last three years. We've been able to provide this service to farmer at a fee and the, we, there is a willingness to pay for this service. Verification of agriculture, we, we started this uh, service four months ago as a result of some of the challenges we are facing in the agricultural sector in Nigeria. So we provide a background check services for, for any agribusinesses and agricultural investment platform. So we already provide the service. And the last one is the financial inclusion for farmers. Being on the system, it means that a farmer must open the, a bank account. He must have an account. And what happened is this, as far as the transaction is going, what it, it means to the farmer is that it contributes to their credit point, which, is, which will actually help them in uh, being financially included. The next slide. Key actors are, first, the primary key actors 
are the seller, who are the small and medium scale farmers. That's our target. That's our first. The second one is the buyers. Uh, the buyers, we are looking at household buyers, those that, that, that actually order the small quantity. We are looking at traders, and we are also looking at processors who order in large quantity. The secondary key actors, we have the third party services, which is the payments and logistics solutions. This one are the one that we've integrated into the system. And the last one is the tertiary key actors, which are the industry regulators. The next. Uh, conditions for enhancing actors' compression. One is a prompt payment of service providers and sellers. And uh, one thing is uh, immediately, uh, the, immediately the goods are delivered, which is, there is a tracking system, they get their payment immediately. Effective feedback mechanism. So uh, one thing is if there are issues within the system, maybe within the, 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 the movement of produce or the quality at the end of it, there's a, there's a feedback mechanism where you can rate the services of your logistic company or the products you have purchased from the, from the seller. So there is a feedback mechanism where we can actually check, okay, this is a feedback mechanism, this is how we can respond, and there's a way we respond to feedback within a short period of time. The tracking system for actors to ensure transparency of operations. Yes, everyone see what is going on. You know where your product is, you know where it's, it's left, you know when it's going to be delivered. And if there are any challenges on the way, you are sure of it. So there is transparency. And the last one is effective and efficient customer support system. This is very key for the success of this, uh, of this idea because the customer service system is so key. And uh, that 